from the road. Paul Watson's coming up in the fourth hour and will be addressing an article he has written for Infowars.com that breaks down another shocking example of the mass Stockholm Syndrome sweeping not just Europe but also the United States. At an anti-racism concert in Sweden, migrants raped women in the middle of the crowd. This is in mainstream news in Sweden. In Germany, a German minister, it's now been discovered, was raped. A federal minister and covered it up and blamed it on Germans as to not turn the population against the Muslims. Ladies and gentlemen, I was against the illegal wars in the Middle East because I thought it would stir up that population and be part of the clash of civilizations the globalists have written about using the clash, the crisis, to destroy Western liberties and to actually put even more radical jihadists in control in the Middle East, as General Flynn and others have spoken about and exposed. But here's the bottom line to all you PC scumbags. You ally yourselves with authoritarianism, and then you go around bullying true liberals and the bastion of freedom in the West, telling us we've got to give up our language, we've got to give up our freedom, we've got to comply with every foreign alien system like Islam that absolutely enslaves women, absolutely is intolerant of other religions, and murders homosexuals. You people are intellectually bankrupt, and you're financed by the globalist, and the whole Black Lives Matter organizations, the rest of it are a joke. We've had Black Lives Matter people calling in yesterday and saying, Alex, you just don't like black people. That's a load of horse manure. You people are idiots. George Soros is a Nazi collaborator, piece of crap that brings down countries, and he's using sociology, and he's using psychology to play us off against each other and take almost non-existent issues and make it the number one red herring while he prepares with others to totally implode this country. So I suggest you wake up and get up off your fat intellectual dumbasses and start trying to save civilization. The globalists are bringing in tyranny because it'll merge with their system of tyranny and they think Islam will work with the socialists and the social engineers to bully us into full submission. Well, guess what? It isn't working and I'm pissed. Everybody else is getting angry and we're never going away. We're never giving up and we know what's going on. Now back to David Knight, live in studio. All right then, I'm here in the studio on this uh, Tuesday, July 12th, 2016. I'm David Knight. Alex is going to be joining us later in the show with other special reports. Of course, he's going to be talking about Bernie Sanders, who is endorsing Hillary Clinton today. No surprise there. One thing you may be surprised about Bernie Sanders is that he's been getting $38,000 a day Secret Service protection as he's been going on this uh, ego trip of futility that he's going on. And of course, you know, he wants free college for everybody. Uh, $38,000, that would go a long way towards paying some people's uh, annual tuition. But uh, uh, Bernie is just eating that up with his uh, security protection. Understand that one of the most broken institutions we have in this country, of course, is our institution of education, especially higher learning, as they call it. It is nothing but propaganda. Selling the lies that have been created by these 60s radicals about white skin privilege and other things to foment racial division. I'm not saying that we can't talk about the differences in the way people are treated. That's a misunderstanding of that. But the way they use white skin privilege, it was a weapon. Bill Ayers stopped bombing buildings and he started brainwashing our children. That's what's behind this educational establishment. And that's why Bernie and Hillary want free college for everybody. Now, we're going to be talking about what's going on with Trump. We have some breaking news about the effort to stop Trump at the convention. The never Trump people who said there are no committed delegates. Well, a federal judge has just said otherwise. We're going to have that and more news when we come back. Stay with us. We've seen incredible gullibility out of the Republican Party's constituents over the years. Just look at all the lies that George W. Bush supporters put up with. But I got to tell you, Democrats take the cake, especially Bernie Sanders supporters. He came out yesterday and said that, oh, we've realized so many of our goals and we're so victorious and now I'm throwing my support to Hillary. When Hillary is the most corporate, most crony capitalist candidate out of the entire field we've seen the last two years. I mean, she makes 
Donald Trump look like the outsider he is. And it's so sad to see Bernie supporters who are committed to getting their so-called free lunch, buying into anything and everything that the Democratic Party pitches at them. It's so clear that the big money and the big media and all the big robber barons are lined up against Donald Trump. But most of the former Bernie supporters out there that are being pulled are saying, hey, we're going for Hillary. It's truly shameful. Then the corporate media that sells us all these illegal wars and all these other lies is telling us Donald Trump's an evil racist and the worst person in the world and that we all need to support Hillary because that's the best thing to do and that it's good to go out and demonstrate and protest against the local police because they're corrupt. That's the big, out of control, federal government bought and paid for by foreign interests that militarized the police to be their enforcers. Now, because they're concerned about an American style Brexit out of the North American Union and globalism, they're trying to trigger the revolution that's brewing against local government and police. They're trying to distract the public at the same time, bring in a type of soft civil war where the UN can then be the honchos of the reorganization of the United States. Look at the riots all over the country, the police stations being shot up, the police being killed. Can you just walk up to police you don't even know the name of and randomly say you deserve to die? And some will say, well, they do that to some citizens. Statistically, police killings are flat. Even as the crime rate that's been lower for 20 years starts to go up because the economy is imploding. All Americans are starting to see, on average, their living standards go down. We're seeing our basic freedoms under attack. We are collectively, as a citizenry, under attack. And it was so exciting a few weeks ago to see the Brexit, which was a move against globalism, led by the Ron Paul slash Alex Jones slash Matt Drudge of Europe, Nigel Farage, to see that for days be the number one search term, to have more search terms than all porn terms combined. There was one other search term that was also number one for a day and in the top five for an entire week. That was Hillary for prison. It shows the power of we, the populist peoples, the libertarians, the liberta, the true liberators, the liberals, not the controllers, not the counterfeit liberals and their Republican cohorts who are trying to shackle and control this huge awakening that's taking place. I'm going to Cleveland in just a few days. I'm going to be there for the full week of the RNC. We're also sending a crew to the DNC. And we're going to be standing up for the truth. We're going to be exposing that the Republican Party has said they're still going to try to steal the nomination of Donald Trump. We're going to be there exposing the social justice warriors and how programmed they are. And we're going to be putting airplanes in the sky that point out that Hillary should be sent to prison, not the White House. We're going to have trucks driving around town with the same thing on the side. All because you've taken action and believed in us, we believed in you, and the info war is having a giant effect. Now, I've got other reports coming up today that deal with the assault on reality, the attempt to get the average person to not be politically or culturally involved. We're going to be looking at some of the big phenomenons in AI and augmented reality, the new Pokemon Go phenomenon and more. And David Knight's going to be breaking down with his guest, Anthony Gucciardi and others, the latest breaking news and taking your phone calls. But make no mistake, when the entire establishment and the entire media that we know are a pack of criminal liars, discredited frauds, are telling us that Hillary Clinton's our Lord and Savior, if we really elect her, a lot of people deserve what they get. All I know is, I feel like America and the whole world's reached the point of return. It's not that Donald Trump is a perfect solution, but he's a protest against everything we've seen so far. And I hope that we can live up to what our cousins in the UK have done and send out a signal in 2016 that we too are leaving corporate world government, corporate unelected globalism that was rejected in the Brexit. That's what a Donald Trump victory would be. It's time for Americans to wake up. It's time to make America free again. And that will make this country 
great again. All right, back to the live transmission and David Knight. I'll be back later with an analysis on some of the new AI technologies being rolled out. Okay, and I'm David Knight here in the studio on this Tuesday, July 12th, 2016. Alex was just talking about Brexit. And of course, there's some interesting developments going on in Britain as we see the change in Prime Minister happening uh, announced yesterday that it will be changed tomorrow. Now, you know, David Cameron promoted Brexit. Uh, actually, he promoted uh, staying in uh, the uh, EU. Uh, he gave them the referendum. Kind of interesting, you know, because it all came up in a, uh, a pizzeria in Chicago. We were at a uh, Pizzeria Uno, we're told. It was after an economic summit in Chicago. And uh, I guess they were sitting there and uh, saw the Pizzeria Uno as a sign or something. I don't know. Maybe somebody came up to him and said, hey, you want that to go? <laughs> you want to take out? And they said, that's it. We'll do that. Because, you know, they were facing pressure from Nigel Farage and UKIP, which made getting out of the European Union one of their core issues. Why? Because of sovereignty. You know, the border issue is just one aspect of the sovereignty. They were completely shutting down and controlling the British economy. Issues like not allowing British fishermen to uh, uh, fish in the North Sea or Britain to even have a say in that issue. Not to have a say in how their trade was going to be managed. No, they were being completely dominated by these bureaucrats in Brussels. So they had the Brexit. David Cameron, however, wanted to remain in the EU. When they lost, he immediately announced that he was going to get out. They were going to, he was going to let somebody else in the Conservative Party take over the leadership and manage this uh, transition out of the EU. What we saw then was a contest. Most people believe that Boris Johnson was going to uh, be the one to take over the leadership of the Conservative Party. Uh, he shortly took himself out, said Michael Gove is going to uh, uh, not, it was apparent that he was not going to support Boris Johnson, was going to run for it himself. Then he left. Then we were left with two women, and the news articles were, we're going to have a British prime minister that is female for the first time since Margaret Thatcher. Then suddenly yesterday, the one of the females in it dropped out. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, and the uh, lady who dropped out yesterday, they were all supportive of Brexit. They all wanted to see Britain leave the EU. The one person who was in the race, Theresa May, who is now going to be the prime minister by default. They've cut these deals in back rooms. She was, she's now going to be the prime minister by default. She was the one person out of all these candidates up for leadership of the Conservative Party that did not support Brexit. Now, she is saying that uh, Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. Nevertheless, David Cameron said, we're not going to do anything with this. We're not going to file the paperwork to uh, get out of the treaty until September, when we have our decision to uh, have a new leader of the Conservative Party. They very quickly and abruptly set a new leader of the uh, Conservative Party. But now, even though that's happened very quickly, they're saying they're going to delay it another three months before they start the process of leaving uh, the European Union. So now we go not from a delay of three months, but to a delay of six months before they even start the process. Even more troubling, this article that we had last, uh, we talked about it last night on the Nightly News, we had it on uh, Infowars.com uh, yesterday, Brexit vote was not binding so Parliament must decide, said lawyers. Okay, this is about a 1,000 British lawyers who have signed a letter saying that uh, invoking Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty is not something that the Prime Minister can do on, on their own. The argument is that Parliament turned over their sovereignty to the European Union and only Parliament can take it back. And then get this. They said the Brexit referendum was merely an advisory. Merely an advisory. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like what the Republican delegates who are saying never Trump are saying to us? Saying, we don't really care about all of your primaries, all of your elections. Those were merely advisories, and we're not going to really pay any attention to that. We're going to not violate our consciences, okay? We're going to violate the public trust. And we've now had an interesting uh, case from a judge, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I don't want to leave Brexit yet. At the same time this is happening, the British people need to understand that the same issues that caused them to vote to leave the European Union are still there. And they're there in spades, okay? 
We have this article from the Deutsche Bank Economist uh, that said on Sunday that the EU banks need another $166 billion. Now, I don't know where they get that because uh, the Italian banks by themselves need $360 billion uh, euros. They've got bad loans of that amount. They were looking for the British to essentially bail them out of that. And they're very upset that they don't have that money. I actually heard somebody in the immediate aftermath of Brexit talking about how uh, this is bad. We, you know, we, we haven't talked about this, but we really need British money. We didn't mention it as the, uh, we, the run-up to the uh, referendum because we didn't want to scare the people in Britain. We didn't want them to vote against this. But that's the reality. And at the same time, this Deutsche Bank economist says, well, you know, I don't expect to see a second financial crisis like 2008. But we have another article that we had uh, yesterday on Infowars.com from David Stockman. Remember him from the Reagan administration? He said, here we go again. He said the conditions are even worse now. Hang on, we'll be right back. We're going to have some information about Hillary. Hillary. We're going to have Alex Jones joining us in the next segment. He's going to talk about who he thinks Donald Trump is going to pick as his vice president. Of course, the time is getting very close. Uh, we're not even a week away from the Republican convention, if I've got my dates right. I think it begins next Monday. Uh, we've also got an update in terms of the rebellion, uh, and it's a small rebellion, but it is a vocal rebellion of uh, people inside the Republican establishment saying uh, that they are not going to follow the votes as cast by the voters. They say that their conscience, their free speech, trumps that of the voters in the primaries. Uh, that was dealt a major blow today. I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. Before we do, I want to let you know that we've extended our sale uh, that we had for the 4th of July uh, mega sale that we had for the 4th of July week. Uh, we have now extended that for a couple of the items that were on there. We now have uh, still 20% off Survival Shield X2. It's selling out very quickly, but also 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. We have extended those two until tonight. And then they're going to disappear along with the other sale items that we had beginning on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, now is the time to uh, step up and to take advantage of these uh, sales. These are excellent sales. 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. That's something that's going to last you 25 years. Excellent packaging, all made in the USA, GMO-free. Uh, that's something that is a, a real uh, important thing to have in your storage uh, spots to take care of any kind of unrest that we may have, and we're seeing that in spades right now. Again, you can find out about those specials at InfoWarsStore.com. That's 20% off Survival Shield X2 and 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. Now, what happened today with the Never Trump movement? You remember we've had um, uh, this uh, lady, uh, Kendall Unruh, who is a uh, Utah delegate. She has a small organization called Free the Delegates. We also have Curly Hoagland who is the guy who said, uh, hey, uh, we get to do whatever we want to. It's our party. And I remember when he was interviewed on CNN and they said, uh, well, uh, why do we even have primaries then? And he said, good question. I don't think they matter. And then we had this guy in Virginia. His name is Bo Coral. He's a lawyer. He filed a class action lawsuit in Virginia challenging a state law that binds delegates to support the winner of the election. He said that's a violation of his First Amendment rights. Well, what about our First Amendment rights? Do we have rights? I mean, these people have the attitude of the superdelegate mentality that we're seeing in the Democrat Party. And it's interesting as we look at the uh, collapse of uh, Bernie Sanders, the, uh, the fact that he is totally sold out. And we've got an article up on Infowars.com, uh, Dump the Burn. Dems revolt after Bernie endorses Hillary. We've got a lot of people on social media that are tweeting out their disillusion with this whole process. Look, folks, uh, he totally sold out. When we talk about uh, where he was on these issues, he did get Hillary to uh, jump in on the bandwagon of free college for everybody, everybody in the world, you know, because anyone in the world can come here with our open borders. And if they come here with their open borders, then they're entitled to a free education. Or at the very least, right now, they get uh, in-state tuition, which American citizens whose parents have lived there, here all their life, who have paid taxes all their lives, they don't get that same kind of consideration for in-state tuition. But if you come here as an illegal immigrant, you can go to any state you want to and get in-state tuition. But they want to make that free for everybody. And understand that when we look at, uh, I guess, you know, 
take a look at your tax bills. You'll probably find, especially you'll be aware of this if you own a house, if you are renting, you may not see it because it's buried in your rent costs. But the largest taxes that most of us pay are property taxes. And you pay those property taxes even if you rent. They're embedded in your rent. You just don't see it. So people aren't aware of it. What is the major expense on your property taxes? It's the schools. And the schools are exploding. And, of course, we have to have tutors to teach people in whatever language they demand coming into this country. And so let's expand this. Let's give everybody free college tuition. It isn't going to make anything cheaper. You know, when you subsidize things, they get quite a bit more expensive. So college costs are going to soar out of control. But that's okay. We're going to educate the world. And all it's going to cost you is everything you own. It's going to cost you the ability to own a home because you're not going to be able to afford the taxes. So Bernie got Hillary to move along with him on that. But what he didn't get her to move along with was the opposition to these trans-Pacific and transatlantic partnerships. These so-called partnerships are actually trade treaties. Okay? She's not going to give up on that. You got to understand that's where the big money is. They want to have these deals. They were created by corporations in secret. They want to push these controls and understand it is not free trade. It is management of your economy by a committee that you have no influence or control over. It's what the British people just said we've had enough of. Stay with us. We'll be right back. As Donald Trump picked his VP running mate, more and more the rumblings are that it's former General Michael T. Flynn. Michael T. Flynn has been a registered Democrat for most of his life. Uh, he seems to be pretty moderate on a lot of his policies. Is that smart for Donald Trump to do when if Donald Trump gets assassinated, then we would be uh, basically under the control of someone who leans more Democrat than he does Republican? I'm not trying to shoot down General Flynn. In fact, I've been a big supporter and fan of what he's done in his career, and I've followed a lot of his work. But I want to throw out one of the cons, one of the problems before we look at the good points. Now, let's go back to about a month ago. At that time, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, who I think is a great guy, was at the top of the list. The problem is they're already pushing this racist narrative against Trump where he puts a star on one of his advertisements and they say it's anti-Semitic. I mean, it's getting crazy. And so they can obviously dig back into Republican politics in the 60s and 70s and the young Republicans uh, that Senator Sessions was part of and try to claim some racism angle. I personally say double down and who cares what the political correct are going to do. They're always lying anyways. Uh, should he go for some Republican governor, woman, or senator? Uh, yeah, if they're a constitutionalist, they've got what it takes. They've got a good record. I'm all for having a woman VP. But it shouldn't just be a gimmick. Because it's a woman. They're talking about Hillary doing Elizabeth Warren for an all-woman ticket just because they're women. Again, that's a gimmick. I'm sick of it. But getting back to why I like Michael T. Flynn, he really reformed a lot of the work in special forces. He called for overseas spying, not domestic spying. He called for agency sharing information. He tried to really stick up for people in the military, but he also had more courage than anybody I've ever seen in modern times in the military and then he came out last year on Al Jazeera and other platforms, and he said, look, Obama basically ordered us to help al-Qaeda, to help ISIS, and that's who we've been fighting on the side of for years. And the reporter said, oh, my God, so they didn't know. And he says, no, they knew and ordered that. He talked about the elephant in the room. In 2012, your agency was saying, quote, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the U.S. Yeah. was helping coordinate arms transfers to those same groups. Why did you not stop that if you're worried about the rise of, quote, unquote, yeah, Islamic I, I, I mean, I hate to say it's not my job, but that my job was to, was to ensure that the, that the accuracy of our intelligence that was being presented was, was as good as it could be. And I will tell you, it goes before 2012. I mean, when we, were, when we were in Iraq and we still had decisions to be made before there was a decision to pull out of Iraq in 2011. I mean, it was very clear what we, were, what we were going to face. Well, just to clarify once more, you are basically saying that even in government at the time, you knew those groups were around, you saw this analysis sure. and you were arguing against it. But who wasn't listening? I think the, I think the administration. 
the administration turned a blind eye to your analysis? I don't know if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al Qaeda, well, and Muslim a willful Brotherhood. decision to do what they're doing, which which you have to really you have to really ask the president, what is it that he actually is doing with the with the uh, policy that is in place because. It is very, very confusing. I'm sitting here today, Maddie, and I don't, I can't tell you exactly what that is. And I've been at this for a long time. What Seymour Hersh has written about, what, what, what we broke, what Colonel Schaefer has talked about, with, what Steve Pachanik has talked about. He was the head of defense intelligence in the middle of all this. And here he is exposing it on international television. That shows courage. And if he'll expose the nexus point between Criminal elements in our government, bipartisan, John McCain, Obama, Hillary, arming radical jihadists to take over Libya, parts of Syria, Iraq, you name it, and show that they're working with Saudi Arabia to betray this nation in Europe. He gets my support right there because he's also talking about the plan for a European caliphate. He's talking about the plans to flood us with migrants for destabilization. He basically got in trouble from Obama and taken out in 2014, despite the fact he was an innovator. Despite the fact he was a Democrat, because he kept saying radical Islam, radical Islam. Well, orthodox Islam is radical Islam. He's not even going further enough saying that, but he got removed for saying radical Islam when it is Islam that is engaged in hundreds and hundreds of terror attacks. And it's Sunni based, funded by Saudi Arabia. So the word is right now he's at the top of the list, and Trump could announce by Friday they're planning. The current word is, Trump changes his mind, obviously, he's an innovative thinker himself, uh, that by Friday or Saturday they're going to be announcing the VP, and that right now Michael T. Flynn is right up there at the top. So is Jeff Sessions, but not at the very top anymore. He's still on the top three names. Michael T. Flynn. Don't forget what he said on Al Jazeera. Don't forget the article is also linked on Infowars.com because if we can show that our own government is financing Black Lives Matter and ISIS and Al-Qaeda to destabilize the world and bring in more control, we can really reverse uh, a lot of the activities that the social engineers are involved with. I'm Alex Jones. Now back to Infowars Nightly News. <laughs> And here in the studio, I'm David Knight. And as uh, Alex was just talking about the upcoming uh, convention, it's important to remember some of these other names that are coming up there. Of course, we have um, Newt Gingrich. We have uh, Governor Pence. And it's interesting that both of these guys, I believe if uh, Trump were to pick them, it would be a repudiation of the reasons, in my opinion, to vote for Trump. And that is, you know, he's standing for uh, closing the open borders. He's standing against these globalist trade deals that are going to destroy our sovereignty. That's something that uh, Senator Sessions has been very consistent, very strong on, but it's something that uh, Pence and Newt Gingrich have not. Now, Pence has opposed the open borders, Newt Gingrich hasn't, uh, but uh, he is, both of them have been uh, big so-called free trade guys. Free trade in the sense of NAFTA or CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which Pence supported. Pence also has publicly supported the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as has Newt Gingrich. But then when Newt Gingrich started sniffing around the vice presidency, he changed his position on that issue. So I think that it would be a major betrayal of the principles that Donald Trump has espoused to pick either of those. I still hope that it is Senator Sessions. He is a man of unimpeachable integrity. He has always stood for the Constitution. I'll never forget his questioning of um, Leon Panetta who at the time was defense secretary. He's been defense secretary and CIA secretary, questioning him on the conditions under which our government would go to war, as the Obama administration saw. Would you seek Congress's vote? Or And, of course, uh, Panetta said, uh, well, we'd let you know what we decide, but we would talk to the U.N. and we'd talk to NATO and make our decision and let you know. And Senator Sessions was like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. You are a congressman. You swore an oath to the Constitution. What's the matter with you? So he, he's a person of integrity. He's the only senator who read these sovereignty-destroying trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic Partnerships, and he lectured Congress on it before they voted with the Trade Promotion Authority to ignore the constitutional process of ratifying treaties, just as they don't care what the process is for going to war. They don't care what the process is for ratifying a treaty. 
The treaty is ratified under the Constitution with two-thirds of the Senate voting for it. it. says nothing about the House of Representatives. What these people did was they said, well, we're just going to go with a simple majority. But don't worry, we'll throw in the House of Representatives as well. And that's not the constitutional process. Also, they shut down any debate, any amendment, any filibusters. They shut down any means that would block these trade agreements from coming to the floor. They have to come to the floor when it's in a short period of time uh, once they are sent over by the president to be signed. They have destroyed and thumbed their noses at the Constitution. And the only senator who stood up and said anything about that was Senator Sessions. And he took the time to put together a presentation with a, a big whiteboard behind him. Uh, actually, it wasn't a whiteboard. It was um, a series of uh, papers that he uh, had printed up to try to educate the congressman. And it isn't the problem that they're ignorant. They just don't care. They're bought off by these large financial interests, as Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are. And you can see that today. When Bernie Sanders supports Hillary Clinton, he didn't get anything on the opposition to these sovereignty-destroying, jobs-destroying trade deals. Now, thinking liberals are going to understand that. They need to understand what is at issue here. And that is a, that is a very important thing. Now, as we look forward to the convention, as I mentioned in the last segment, uh, one of these legal challenges uh, to uh, the primaries, we actually have these arrogant Republican delegates who say, your votes don't matter. This is a guy, basically, we could call it the superdelegate lawsuit. This is Bo Carell. And, you know, I put out, uh, field, I, I, I contacted all three of these people, the guy, uh, uh, Hoagland, as well as uh, Unruh and this Bo Carell guy. I said, come on, let's talk about this. Let's talk about how your rights trump those of the voters. Okay, they say, oh, it's a private club. This is our own organization. It is not a public thing. We should not be subject to any laws except that they use their monopoly, or we should say their duopoly status, these two major parties, to thoroughly control the election process. And they also use taxpayer money to run these elections. And they tell everybody that it's an election. But then when the election is held, they go back behind closed doors, and Cruz starts selecting his delegates. This guy, by the way, was a Cruz person uh, doing these dirty tricks, as is Unruh. And I, I don't know about Hoagland, who he uh, uh, was supporting. But that's the kind of corruption we're seeing. And we see that kind of corruption within the Democrat Party. Understand, the Democrat Party did their bias, they did their, their uh, private dance up front, if you will. Okay, Hillary started out with 15% of the delegates that she needed. In every one of these states, 10 to 15% of the delegates were set up as superdelegates. And then all of the Democrat states were done proportionally. That meant that a challenger had to beat her by 10 to 15% in the popular vote to even break even on the delegates. That's how they rigged their position, okay? The Republicans, on the other hand, they did most of theirs after the fact. So you would have an election, and then after the fact, they would come in with Ted Cruz and quietly try to appoint their people instead of people who supported the person that everybody voted for. So if you voted for Trump, wouldn't you think that uh, Trump would get people who are loyal to him? So if they have a brokered convention, they would fight it that way. So now it looks as the, if that uh, is going to be shut down. That was one of the last um, uh, efforts they had to shut that down. So it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. This convention coverage, both of these conventions, are going to be very interesting. There is going to be a lot of uh, uh, protests, uh, possibly violent. I don't know. I, I don't think we're going to, uh, I don't think we've seen anything like these conventions since the 1968 Democrat conventions in Chicago, those riots that were there. I think we're going to see a lot of that happening. Now, coming up in the program, we're going to talk about police reform. We're going to talk about the killer robots. We're also going to talk about the killer self-crashing cars. We've had a third crash from Tesla, and the SEC is also taking a look at Tesla and the fact that they made a lot of money in the stock market in the nearly two months that they waited before making public the issues that they had with Autopilot. Remember, Autopilot is a key selling feature of their cars. And if you don't tell people that you're having problems with this, if you cover that up and you make major trade deals on the stock market, the SEC is starting to get interested in that. Okay? They've had the Department of Transportation in Washington running interference for these Silicon Valley car manufacturers like Google and Tesla. 
saying we're not going to allow states and local communities to establish safety laws. We're going to shut those down just as they do for GMO regulation, right? We want to know what's in our food. So a lot of states and communities have started putting in GMO labeling laws. They said, no, nah, we're tired of trying to fight these things uh, one by one. We've lost a couple of these. So let's just shut this down at the federal level. So they got together with Big Agra, and uh, they're, they're going to uh, uh, put pressure on the government. We've had the uh, Dark Act come up to shut down the truth about what is in your food in the same way. They don't like the fact that uh, people in California are starting to look at all the accidents around these cars that we're told are going to put an end to all deaths on the highway. You've heard that, right? You've heard that many times. 30,000 plus people killed every year on the highways. Well, we're just going to stop all of that completely. These cars will not make mistakes. And we've been pointing out how much of a lie that is from the very beginning. You don't think your computer crashes. You don't think your iPhone crashes. You don't think you have problems when they update the software on your iPhone. And now the old model no longer works. They're taking that same attitude and they're going to put it on the road, driving your car. So we're going to take a look at that as well as some of the ethical issues that were exposed with the killer robots in Dallas. Also, the Pokemon Go uh, augmented reality. What is that about? What are the issues behind that? We had a, uh, an article yesterday from Kit Daniels talking about how InQtel, the... Uh, venture capital firm of the CIA uh, was uh, had some connections with the company that was behind this new uh, piece of software. It has truly gone viral. We've never seen anything like this. It's added about $8 billion worth of market cap value to Nintendo. It's incredibly huge. Okay, And half a day, it became the number one selling app on Apple. And understand, it's, it's very different from uh, virtual, uh, virtual reality. It doesn't create an entire... A uh, reality system that you put on blinders and uh, move around in a room. Instead, you go out and you walk around and it shows uh, on your phone where you really are, but then it augments that and puts little Pokemon characters that you can collect and then take to other places and have battles with them. That's the idea behind augmented reality. At first glance, you look at it and you say, well, great, it gets the kids off of the couch and it gets them out and around, but then there's other issues, issues of Privacy. And so we're going to take a look at several different uh, technological issues uh, that, are, that are presenting themselves to society at this moment. But before we do, we've had uh, Bernie Sanders endorsing Hillary Clinton. We've got Loretta Lynch at this moment uh, talking to Congress about her tarmac tete-a-tete with Bill and why Hillary is not being indicted. And I think maybe what we should have is a, a T-shirt that instead of uh, Hillary for prison, maybe Hillary for privilege. Uh, you know, when you look at Bill Ayers, the guy who popularized this whole idea with the uh, uh, weather underground and the uh, Students for Democratic Society back in the 1960s, this whole idea of white privilege, who weaponized that idea. This is one of the most privileged white people you have ever seen. Okay, This is a guy whose dad was incredibly wealthy, who was able to go on a terrorist spree and then escape all prosecution. That's white privilege, okay? That's real privilege. And Hillary is the same kind of person. Look at this story from the New American. Hillary Clinton contends systemic bias in the U.S. criminal justice system targets blacks. And it's like, well, I guess exhibit A would be Hillary Clinton. Because as she's pontificating about how blacks are unfairly targeted, we also see that a black congresswoman, Corrine Brown, has been indicted for guess what? using a phony charity, you mean like the Clinton Foundation, to skim money from people, and she is not going to get off. She's facing 357 years in prison. How's that for disparity between the white privileged grand mal, Hillary Clinton, and a black congressman? Uh, stay, congressman, stay with us. We'll be right back. We'll talk about uh, Hillary Clinton's privilege here in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to remind you that we have extended the sale on uh, this is from our July 4th mega sale. We had uh, several items that are on tremendous discount. We've continued two of those as a thank you to those of you who support our operation. We've had a lot of demand for Survival Shield X2 and the storable food deals. We've extended this now until tonight. Uh, this is 20% off Survival Shield X2 which is rapidly selling out, and 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. We've now extended that 
to tonight. You can find that at InfoWarsStore.com. Now is the time to prepare for unrest. As we look at the summer of chaos coming up, as we look at the push by our government uh, to try to not only federalize the police, but try to push for martial law and to divide us into a race war. We don't know really what's going to happen in the future. It's time now to be prepared for yourself, for your family. Stock up while the discount is 20 to 40 percent off InfoWars Select Storable Food. That ends tonight. Uh, we've extended it as long as we can. Also, uh, Survival Shield X2, which is also uh, still 20 percent off. That ends tonight as well. Okay, let's talk about Hillary. The woman who says that there is so much bias against black people, and yet here we see a black congresswoman, Kareem Brown, who's been indicted, who's looking at 357 years in prison for doing what? She took $800,000 in donations to a supposed charitable organization. Uh, One Door for Education was the name of it. But she was accused of using that as a personal slush fund. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like the Clintons? And yet, what does Hillary get? Nothing. We well, want to talk about uh, <laughs> want to talk about white privilege. Uh, that's Hillary Clinton. Now we've got uh, as another example of how she is setting all new precedents. How, as I've said in the past, you know they've taken this religion of national security. They've used it to destroy our due process. They've used it to destroy our legal system, our privacy, our Bill of Rights. And yet here we have Hillary Clinton thumbing her nose at that state religion. But we have uh, some uh, here at U.S. News uh, Report. They say attorneys for people who have allegedly mishandled classified information are saying they want the same deal that Hillary Clinton got. And this is a defense attorney who uh, works for national security whistleblowers. And he points out that uh, he thinks that he can get a Clinton deal for his clients in the future. He said in 2015, shortly after CIA Director David Petraeus got a plea bargain, uh, which was just a slap on the wrist, you know, probation and a small fine because he shared highly classified information with his mistress. He said, we absolutely got on the phone to the prosecutor and said, hey, we want the Petraeus sentence. We want the commensurate uh, parallel sentence. And he said, we got it. So he just got a small thing. So he says, I fully expect that we're not going to uh, see jail time for any of uh, my clients who violate national security. Now, understand, some of these people should not be going to jail. We've talked about Thomas Drake. We've talked about how they manufactured charges against him. Hillary Clinton's correspondence that she was using to uh, cover up her secret deals, that was born classified. When she's talking to a head of state and the private conversations that they have that are recorded there, that's born classified. We also saw her instructing employees to remove the classified heading so it could be transmitted. That was in the emails as well. And yet, in the case of Thomas Drake, who was a bona fide whistleblower, who was talking about how the NSA was violating the Constitution, violating even the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, they went to his house and they found a couple of documents. As we've mentioned this before, they said, hey, uh, this isn't classified, uh, but you should have known that it should have been classified. It should have been classified. And you should have known it. Another one, they said, well, it's not classified. They classified the same day, then unclassified it three months later. That's the double standard. And it isn't just a racial one. It's one standard for the people at the top, the corrupt criminals. You know, a government rots from the head down. And that's what we're seeing with the Clintons. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I want to play a, a short clip of uh, Bernie Sanders uh, talking about the uh, Democrat platform. But before we do, I want to continue with what I was talking about with Hillary Clinton. Of course, uh, Alex Jones is going to be joining us in the next segment, and he's going to be talking about the Pokemon Go phenomenon. What's behind that? Uh, we're both going to be talking about that in the next segment. But again, talking about Hillary and talking about her special privilege, the corruption that she embodies. We now have an interesting uh, thing that is developing. We have the uh, Judicial Watch, people who have been uh, following very closely and have really exposed a lot of stuff with their freedom of uh, information requests. Uh, they've been done a great job of investigating, of uncovering the corruption of the Clintons. Uh, now, a judge has given Hillary Clinton until today. So we'll see what's going to happen with this. Uh, this is a story from World Net Daily to reveal why she should not be forced to testify in a federal case about her aid, and uh, we put that uh, term in quotes, Huma Abedin, uh, double-dipping employment at the State Department, okay? 
So again, we've got a black congresswoman who is facing 357 years in prison because she had a bogus charitable foundation. You know, kind of like the Clinton Foundation, except she got $800,000 instead of tens of millions of dollars, or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, as the Clintons uh, may have done over the years. Uh, instead of just being dismissed, uh, she's going to be looking at 357 years in prison, possibly. That's the double standard we see. And so this uh, Judicial Watch is asking a federal judge for permission to put Hillary Clinton under oath. Isn't that interesting? Because one of the most interesting short segments out of the uh, questioning of Comey on, uh, on, for the Congressional Committee was to ask him point blank, I think it was Trey Gowdy, said uh, to the FBI director, did Hillary Clinton lie? And Comey just kind of paused for about three seconds. And then he says, uh, to us, no. <laughs> she lied to everybody else. She lied to Congress. She committed perjury in Congress. Of course, you know, they could uh, refer that to guess who? Loretta Lynch and the FBI to investigate. You think they would? No, they're not going to investigate her perjury before Congress. She gets a free pass. She gets a coup for a, right? Uh, nobody's a get out of jail card uh, for free, okay? That's what Hillary Clinton gets and all these things. But he said, no, she didn't lie to the FBI. And I would have to say... I would really like to see the transcripts of the recordings of that. Oh, that's right. There's not any transcripts or recordings. In other words, did she really tell them the truth? Did she lie under oath? Or did they just not ask her the relevant questions? Because he began by talking about how she had violated uh, security laws, said that she had sent and received classified email. I mean, that's a felony. Did he not ask her that? Did you... Send to receive classified emails. She said over and over again how she did not do that. And yet, uh, maybe they didn't ask her that. But Judicial Watch is going to ask this judge to put her under oath so they can ask her questions about this illegal double-dipping of her close, close aide, Huma Abedin. Okay, now also coming up with this, uh, as they point out on this another article from WND, they say that uh, FBI director... Uh, let her walk. But one of the things that he said was that uh, she was extremely careless. Uh, he, in testimony, said that she was not just careless, but he implied that she didn't really understand the importance of the information that she was handling. And they pointed out in this article, well, that's something that we've heard from people who know the Clintons very well. Bill Clinton's childhood friend, former lover Dolly Kyle, has long alleged that Hillary Clinton suffers from cognitive impairment. So the lady who dresses like Chairman Bao, who wants us to see her as her grandmother, uh, I guess we could call her Grandma, uh, now that is out there. But don't worry, they're going to cover that up as well. Uh, no matter what she does, even Facebook covers for Hillary Clinton, especially Facebook. They've now taken down a uh, page that had memes that mocked Hillary Clinton. Can't do that. We can put up uh, memorials to Black Lives Matter, but they're not going to say anything about the dead police at their headquarters. Stay with us. Alex Jones will be right back talking about Pokemon Go. It's called augmented reality. I thought humans interfacing with this incredible third dimension, having sight, having smell, having taste, having touch, having emotions and feelings inside our hearts. I thought that was augmented reality. I thought that was consciousness. But now we're told it's the number one search, five, six days running, Pokemon Go. In fact, some of the amazing crew members at our own office are playing it. And I'm not judging them for checking out something new and interesting. My kids have played Pokemon, you know, the card game, years ago. You have these little monsters that you play against each other. You've got to go find the monsters, capture them, train them, all the rest of it. Whatever. Board games have been around. Chess games have been around three, 4,000 years. That's great. The problem is, is that we see more and more people living in second life, buying Ferraris with real money that don't really exist, forming fake relationships in cyberspace and becoming very unsuccessful in the real world. And we see the social engineers pushing as hard as they can to get people to tune out of the real world. This incredible planet hurtling through space and our amazing moon and all the other things that are happening on our planet and dial into artificial systems created by Nintendo or by Microsoft or by Google or by Apple. They are creating the universes 
in which we interface instead of humans living in the real universe and being creative, sentient beings yourself. They are building false realities into which they want to induct you so they can play God. So I'm not saying anybody's bad who wants to play video games or who wants to be involved in World of Warcraft or any of that. All I'm saying is the metrics are there. Our IQs are dropping. The screen time is lowering our IQs. Our synapses are collapsing. Humanity is in crisis. And Pokemon Go is illustrating my own fact. Ambulance drivers, EMTs across not just the U.S. but the world are saying that suddenly, because there's augmented reality, kids that have never been outside their house, that spend less time on average than prisoners do outside, are suddenly out in the real world looking for these mythical monsters so they can show off for their friends and collect more. So in a way, the Matrix is actually backfiring on itself as it attempts to go out and take over reality. That's what Microsoft and others have said they want for decades, is to have every real area of the world with this whole data list and this whole information cube around it to track what you do. But in a way, it's actually backfiring as people go out into the real world themselves looking for the false reality. But I can't get over the image of brain-dead zombies that we see on TV walking, looking at their phones, going into traffic. I can't help but think about the images of people that walk into fountains at malls or that drive off cliffs while they're watching their GPFs or drive into raging rivers because they're making this their entire consciousness. I mean, I'm out here supposedly at a nearby golf course looking for one of these Pokemons. And I'm told that it's magically laid some eggs about 100 yards over there and that I can go over there and watch it hatch and capture it for myself. But in truth, it's not really there. It's being geolocated. I'm being tracked. Everything I'm doing, by the way, by this app, it admits it's been hacking millions of people's phones. And I'm now feeding this data to the matrix of where I am and what I'm doing to find some mythical projection that it's shooting onto my phone. Again, this is giving all of my personal privacy, all of my personal power over to Nintendo to sell my habits, to sell my behaviors, to sell my data to whoever they want. The studies don't lie. This dehumanizes you. This ends up destroying your humanity in the final equation. If you use it in limited amounts, sure, it's interesting. You can meet like-minded people that are into it. I'm not judging anybody, Lord knows. I'm just simply pointing out we should ask ourselves why Pokemon has been more popular the last five, six days than porn. When I heard that the British exit from the Euro was more popular than porn, the only thing in years to beat that, I was proud of the people. Anti-globalism is number one, even above simulated procreation. But the truth is, porn is just like this. It's simulated. It isn't real. You're living through somebody else's template, somebody else's intercourse, somebody else's activities that are then edited and presented and sold to you. So while they live, you sleep. And that's all I'm saying. Every study, every piece of research shows it, that forest bathing and getting outdoors and being in the open air and looking up at the sky raises your awareness, raises your IQ, getting in the wind, feeling the reality, seeing the birds fly around in the air. But I tell you, it is sacrilege to the gamers and sacrilege to the TV heads who you get around and they don't talk about what's happening in the world. They don't talk about what they're doing with men or women. They don't talk about what they're doing with art. They don't talk about hiking or camping trips they're going on. They don't care about their work. They don't care about the world. They, they're cynical and don't care about the new world order on average. All they want to do is live in their fantasy land. And I, for one, am sick and tired of that. And I'm reaching into those people that are living in false worlds built by other people, built by these gaming companies that make billions of dollars off of you, that this is the ultimate form of slavery. And let me be clear. A lot of the big game companies are patriots. A lot of the big game companies are listeners of mine. My God, I've been like eight or nine big video games over the years. I've signed contracts and let them use my voice or image. And there's a lot of good messages in video games, just like movies, just like TV. But there's some bad messages. And the globalist 
are basically pushing this because they don't want you to be involved in the real world. Look, it is kind of fun. I'm going to admit it. To just not look at the sunset over there and not look at the sky or the moon and just start looking at this. It's so much fun. It's so neat. Wait a minute. There's eggs over there. There's, there's something. There's something. There's something hatching. Actually, this is pretty cool, guys. I, I'm into this. Uh, over there. It's, it's oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I just found a new. Can't you see it over there? It's, it's, it's right there. And now I can see it for myself. Ladies and gentlemen, right there. Trigglypuff is the newest Pokemon. It's given birth. Trigglypuff is giving birth. Trigglypuff is giving birth to a baby. To a baby Darth Vader. It's my own fantasy land. I don't have to actually affect change in the real world. I can just believe whatever I want and be a star here. Oh my god. Oh. Keep your hate speech off this death star. Keep your hate speech off this death star. I've actually changed my mind now that I'm in the Matrix. Don't Look outside the television or the internet or the computer. Only look into this world that's real. This world. This world where you could actually create something isn't real. The only world that's real is the world where Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and your trusted local professors tell you what words you're allowed to use. So go back to your dorms and play Pokemon Go. And whatever you do, don't hack into Pokemon and actually create your own characters. Whatever you do, don't use their own memes and their own systems to wake people up. Just conform and pretend you were never conscious and you were never alive. And whatever you do, never visit. While the internet is still somewhat free, Infowars.com. All right, that's Alex Jones, and he's out hunting Pokemon Go. No, that's not what he's really doing. Uh, but he broke that down. And look, the idea is this, folks. You can lose yourself in a virtual reality, or you can lose yourself in an augmented reality. The reality, however, is that we have to always be skeptical of how we view technology. You know, it doesn't really change ethics. It doesn't really change liberty or... Uh, privacy or safety, even though they tell us that it does. They tell us we're operating under new rules. You know, the Constitution doesn't apply because now we have computers. No, the same principles apply. We still have human nature. That's why uh, the founders did such a good job of trying to not have power consolidated in one particular place, but to divide it. That was the whole point of the Constitution. They understood human nature. We're the ones who don't understand human nature. We're the ones who don't understand the big issues of, as I point out, ethics, morality, uh, liberty, safety. That's not a trade-off, folks. You know, when, when Trump tells us that he's going to, uh, that the choice now is between safety and chaos, I'm, I'm concerned because I hear this all the time, that we have to trade off our liberty for safety. People that put a priority on safety, I don't want to live in a safe country. Let me just put it that way. I do not want to live in a safe country country. I want to live free. I don't want people selling me self-crashing cars, telling me that they're going to be safe. No, I want to be able to move about freely with my own vehicle when I want to go. I don't want, it, I don't want to lose the ability to own a vehicle because they're going to make it prohibitively expensive. I don't want to lose the ability to control my movement because they're going to say, well, you know, the, the humans driving are the problem. So now we have to have all the cars under government control. That's where this is all headed, folks. Now, before we uh, go back uh, to, I want to, there's a couple of things I want to say about Pokemon. Uh, before we do, we've got uh, a link up to the uh, story about uh, Dump the Burn, how Democrats are revolting after uh, Bernie has showed himself to be revolting <laughs> when he endorsed uh, Hillary Clinton. It's up on the upper left of uh, Drudge. It's there under Fans Fume. And here's some of the things they said. Uh, so disappointed, Bernie sold out millions. And many of us fell for it, said one former fan. Never again, he says. Another one says, personally, I don't think I'll support Hillary. I don't trust her. She said, I can't see backing someone I don't believe in. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's the way it goes, folks. That's the way it's going to always go. Now, when we come back, we're going to uh, take a look, as I said, about uh, Pokemon. We're going to look at killer robots. We're going to look at killer self-crashing cars. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I am David Knight. 
I want to talk about this Pokemon Go phenomenon here and some of the deeper issues behind it. Alex Jones just talked about it, how we are losing ourselves into this virtual reality and missing out on life, quite frankly. But there's other dangers involved in this as well. But before I do, I want to, re uh, to tell you that um, we have now extended for one more day part of the July 4th mega sales. Now, understand as we're going to be going to report in uh, uh, the two conventions, the Republican and Democrat conventions, this is one way that you can help to fuel the info war. This is the way that we fund our operation. You know, Alex could have uh, funded the operation any number of ways. We could have taken traditional commercial sponsors. Then we would have been captive to the vagaries of people who don't like what we report. You can't remain independent that way. We could have taken charitable donations, or we could have taken government money. But, you know, I really appreciate what Alex did. What he did was he came up with products that addressed the needs that he sees out there. Having clean water, clean air, pure food, having a backup food source, all the sorts of things that we understand that we need in our lives to help you to get the highest quality versions of that and also give it to you at a great price. And then periodically to offer deep, deep discounts. And that's what we've got going now with the sale. We had a lot of sales with a July 4th weekend. We have extended for one more day two of those. That's 20% off Survival Shield X2. That's our nascent iodine. A, a great product. as one of our most popular products. It's selling out very quickly. And, of course, food. 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. A shelf life of 25 years. Great packaging. It can be resealed once you open it for short-term use. And uh, it's made all in America, packaged in America. All the uh, packaging and the food is made in America. It is GMO-free, a great quality of backup source uh, for your food. But that's how you fuel and protect yourself. It's also how you fuel the info war. And I think it's a great way. It's a win-win situation. We really appreciate your support, and we really need it now. As we're sending all of our reporters into the field for these two conventions, it's going to be uh, a lot of coverage that we're going to be doing live. And again... If you want to keep independent media independent, if you want to keep InfoWars going, uh, it's a win-win situation. And we try to help you as much as we can with these discounts. Again, two more, uh, uh, two items that are still on sale ending tonight. That's 20% off Survival Shield X2 and 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. Now, we're talking about money. I tell you, it is a, uh, as, as Wall Street Journal pointed out, this Pokemon Go thing uh, is monster profits. They had their market cap go up 25% and then an additional 13% today. They're up $8 billion in market capitalization. And that's a huge increase because now their total market cap is $30 billion. So just that one particular product, to give you an idea of just how popular it is, uh, they report on RT, they say it has almost surpassed Twitter and daily active users. And this is just with the United States. This is not talking about uh, Europe. Okay, it's not come online with this. It's overtaken Tinder. It's racked up more usage time than WhatsApp, Snapchat, Instagram, and Nintendo's value has increased, as I point out, by $8 billion. Okay, and it hasn't even been out for a week yet. Now, they point out that um, uh, also on the U.S. iPhone uh, revenue, uh, they hit number one in just a half a day. That's pretty much unprecedented. If you look at this uh, article, they talk about how uh, people have found a dead body. I uh, think it's out in Montana. Uh, we've had uh, traffic chaos. One guy says, well, uh, I live in an old church. He said, that means many things. Today it means that my house is a Pokemon Go gym. He said, this should be fascinating. In other words, he woke up to a crowd of people wandering around uh, his house and his garden because they saw that his church had been flagged as a gym. So basically you go around and you collect these little uh, augmented reality uh, characters and then you can take them somewhere and, uh, at a gym and you can have a uh, fighting contest evidently with it. Another person says, just witnessed a car accident because a guy was playing Pokemon and stopped in the road to catch one. See, that's where it becomes dangerous. That's where you take yourself out of reality. As I look at this article from The Hill, Pokemon Go Craze swarms Capitol Hill. They say that uh, they've got all these staffers as well as tourists in the area are going all over these landmarks finding Pokemon. And they say they have them at the Capitol building, at the White House, at the Pentagon, and it's like, uh, that could be pretty dangerous. You might want to have a talk to your kids. Uh, uh, Washington is one of these places where they shoot first and ask questions later, unfortunately. But I think really 
what concerns me about this is the idea that people don't really understand what is behind some of the geospatial intelligence. Okay, that was the article that uh, Kit Daniels talked about yesterday, the link to the CIA developer who was also linked to Incutel, which is the venture capital firm of the CIA. Remember, geospatial intelligence, as we talked about with the Jade Helm situation, is the most, uh, is the fastest growing branch of intelligence that our government has in order to watch us. It is an essential part of that. We're going to talk about that when we come back. We're going to talk about activity-based intelligence. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we were just talking about Pokemon Go. We're just getting to what I think is really the important point about this, and that is its access to our privacy and what that really means for us. And we had this article from uh, Kit Daniels yesterday. Pokemon Go was, is linked to the CIA, and he points out the developer of Pokemon Go, Niantic Inc., was founded by John Hank, who provided who previously received funding from the CIA's venture capital firm, Incutel, to develop what eventually became Google Earth. Incutel was once described as an independent strategic investment firm that identifies innovative technology solutions to support the missions of the U.S. intelligence community. You understand what fascism is? <laughs> fascism is not only just authoritarianism, because, you know, you can have authoritarianism under socialism, but it's also uh, where the government controls private corporations. I mean, why is the CIA getting rich off of this technology? And, of course, uh, that's really what's happening. I mean, we see these guys work for the CIA for decades, and they come out, and somehow, all of a sudden, they get hooked up with a, uh, a sweetheart deal in the oil business and become overnight billionaires. You've seen that over and over again. So, yeah, they, they manipulate uh, markets. They manipulate companies. They invest in companies. But it also, as he points out, it turns your smartphones into essentially an imperial probe droid. Okay, takes real time ground level footage of where you are and monitors where you are. Now, we've talked about this before. We talked about it when we were looking at Jade Helm. Remember, Jade Helm was mastering the human domain. That was the tagline on Jade Helm. Human domain analytics is essentially looking at your activity based intelligence. That's another part of geospatial intelligence. This is the fastest growing division of the intelligence state. Geospatial intelligence. Where are you? Where are you? Understand that when you play Pokemon Go, you open up all of your privacy application, uh, you know, uh, settings to that particular application. So it knows everything about where you are. We're told over and over again, don't worry, the NSA isn't listening to your phone conversations and transcribing them or collecting your text messages. Well, that may or may not be true. They say, we're just looking at your metadata. Your metadata is the most important issue. We've had William Binney, former technical head of the NSA, point that out to us. But look at the geospatial intelligence community. Look at where James Clapper has essentially hung out for the last 15 years. They want to know what you're doing. That's activity-based intelligence. This is a perfect example of it. And they want to take that and map it. That's what human domain analytics is. They want to map where you are, where you go, who you know, what your political beliefs are, what your religious beliefs are. They want to get a full profile of you. It's all about pre-crime analysis. They want to identify who criminals are, who terrorists are, before they even do anything. Minority report style, okay? Understand that. So when we look at that, we need to understand the potential for abuse, and we need to understand that the connections to the people who are constantly abusing our civil liberties, the CIA. And as he points out further in the article, uh, it says, uh, in the early 2000s, Incutel invested, invested in Keyhole Incorporated. The company was founded by this same developer who developed 3D flyby images of buildings and terrain from geospatial data collected by satellites. They named Keyhole was an homage to the KH spy satellites first launched by the American National Reconnaissance Office. This is all tied together, folks. You know, when we look at uh, Jade Helm and the issues involved in that, the fact that it was uh, put out there for people, we'd had multiple drills that were very high profile, surprise drills uh, throughout the country from coast to coast in cities. 
And then we see that there's this massive uh, multi-state drill with all these different intelligence services. And so we talked about that. And nobody ever saw anything when that happened. So what did they do? Did they pull back? We had a couple of communities where the uh, sheriff said, uh, we don't want that happening here because we've seen what these drills have looked like in the past. So maybe they scaled it back or shut it down altogether. Or maybe they did it in the dead of night, did it secretly, because that's really what the whole purpose of it was, was to avoid detection. So maybe they did it, we didn't see them. Or maybe the whole thing was put out there as an effort to see who was going to oppose them, to map that onto their human domain analytics. You have to understand that this is where our government is headed. And as I look at this article from Wired Magazine, artificial intelligence is setting up the Internet for a huge clash with Europe. They're talking about neural networks. Now, this is a particular type of, um, of a network where they essentially model the human brain with a, a network of, um, they, they model the uh, neurons that are inside the human brain in this computer network, okay? That gives them the ability to learn. And they point out in Wired Magazine, they, these computer uh, neural networks have learned to recognize faces and photos, to identify spoken commands, to translate text from one language to another. They're helping to choose what you see when you query Google or where you visit Facebook News. See, that's how they manipulate what you see. That's a key part of human domain analytics. One of the things that they want to do is to see if their propaganda, if their control is working. I mean, at this point, uh, that's a key part of what they're doing. They put this stuff out there. They try to control what you see uh, by controlling your Google searches, by controlling uh, your Facebook news feed, and then they monitor to see how public opinion is being affected. Are they having an effect? Are they winning the information war? Are they controlling your mind? See, that's why they do this. And then they're pointing out that it means that uh, they're going to come into a clash with the European Union because the European Union has put in a law, they call it the right to be forgotten, and we've talked about this before, that would essentially bar private companies from retaining some of this information. Understand, though, that the governments are not going to forget anything. The governments are not going to flush anything down the memory hole. They may come up with draconian fines for private companies to make them flush stuff down the memory hole, but they're not going to forget a single thing that you say or do on the Internet. They're going to store that. And you need to understand that um, at the very least, however, even though I don't think this is going to be very effective to protect privacy. When I look at these, uh, this conflict that uh, Wired Magazine is talking about, think about the fact that at least in Europe, they understand the importance of privacy. We don't even understand the importance of privacy in America anymore. The Fourth Amendment is not only dead, but the principles behind it are not even respected or valued in America anymore. You know, the, we had uh, people who had written that because why? They had Soldiers who were quartered in their homes. They had soldiers who would show up and rifle through their personal belongings. And so they put in protections and said, you're not going to do that without a search warrant. And that search warrant is going to say, it's going to be very specific about what you're looking for, where you're looking for it, who you're looking uh, at, and why. And now we have ignored all of that. We said, we don't really care about our privacy and our personal effects or in our person. You can put your hands on us. You can stop us on the street, and you can frisk and search us. You can make it a condition for us to travel on airplanes and soon on other devices because we value only safety in this country. We don't value anything else. We don't understand the potential for danger that an all-powerful, all-seeing, total information awareness state presents to us. That's the real key. And when I watch people... You know, we, we, we look at this, and, and I see Americans being turned into Pokemon Jigglypuffs, or as we would have said back in my generation when we read books, Eloy. You know, those little pink things that uh, were part of H.G. Wells' time machine. He goes in the future, and he's got uh, all these little uh, pink giggly things called Eloy. And then there's the dark Morlocks that uh, makes, they come out from uh, underground, and uh, some of these Eloy disappear. At first, he thinks that the Eloy are the ones who are in charge. So you think you're in charge, don't you? But you've got to realize that it's this dark underground government, the Morlocks, that are really playing you. You're nothing but their cattle. And they're tracking you 
everywhere you go. When I look at what's happening, and of course, one of these reports about Pokemon Go, they were talking about how oh, I just saw an accident happen because a guy was trying to collect some uh, Pokemon figures in uh, his augmented reality search. Okay. Doesn't that sound like what's going on with our self-crashing cars? See, Tesla has taken an approach where they give you the steering wheel and they're going to augment the driving experience for you, just like Pokemon Go does with augmented reality. Okay. Google is going to give you a full virtual reality experience. They're going to take away your steering wheel. They're going to take away your brakes. Okay. But Tesla is giving you an augmented reality. And we just saw the third accident in just a couple of months involving autopilot or reports of autopilot. Now, Tesla is claiming that uh, autopilot was not involved in some of these crashes, but they're being very vague about it. They're, they're always going to understand. They're always going to blame the human operator as being an error. It's never going to be their software. It's never going to be their car. It's always going to be you. You're going to be the one who is to blame. Part of it is a design problem. This latest crash that happened, uh, and this was out, uh, this was over the weekend, and this was in Montana. Uh, a, a driver, let's call it a driver, okay, a Jigglypuff who was along for the ride, uh, and his other passenger were driving in Montana. They were going in an area that was about 55 to 60 miles an hour, and then there was no center line. Now, at that point, Tesla's so-called autopilot cuts off. And it hands over control to you. But how does it hand over control to you? Does it just quit? Uh, do you, are you, when you're sitting there playing uh, Pokemon Go or watching a Harry Potter movie or whatever you're doing at the time, uh, tweeting, uh, are you going to wake up quickly enough to take back control? Because it just stops driving. <laughs> just goes to sleep. Okay, so what happened in this particular one uh, says... Uh, the vehicle appears to be totaled with the front passenger side being completely torn off, including the wheel. But fortunately, both occupants are reportedly OK. Uh, and uh, so what they're saying is Tesla does not recommend to use the auto steer feature of autopilot on a road without a center divider. And since the release of the 7.1 software update, it limits the speed of the system to the speed limit of the road plus an additional five miles an hour. So it knows the speed limit It's going to be following you with that. It's going to be issuing you fines. That's what's going to happen as our government tracks everywhere we go, just like we're the little Pokemon Go uh, people. Okay, this is, <laughs> yeah, Tesla autopilot for dummy. I talked to uh, Eric Peters yesterday. He has a, uh, he's an automotive writer, an independent automotive writer, very perceptive about what is going on. He talks about it from a libertarian perspective. One of the things he talked about with autopilot ha is how this is not really autopilot. This is really, in his words, a Jetson vision of the future that's being sold to us. It's truly false. Remember back in the 1950s, I, I just was looking at a, 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 a car magazine yesterday when they had all these pictures of 1950s automobiles with their fins, and they had the uh, whole fleet of these cars parked next to uh, a 1950s jet, just in case you missed the analogy, okay? And that's what they're trying to sell us by calling this autopilot. But understand that true autopilot, when that happens, your flight plan is pre-programmed. They make sure that there are no other uh, planes anywhere close to you. You can't do that in a real world. And so what's going to happen is they're not going to space out your car miles and miles away from every other car and remove every possible object from you. No, what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that there are no humans that can get in your way. Of course, that doesn't mean that uh, there's not going to be other things that, there's not going to be humans driving cars, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be other things that are going to uh, get in the way and are going to, there you go, there's the, the 1950s. Everybody wanted their cars to look like a rocket ship. And now they want to imagine that their cars are uh, really planes again now. Uh, that's where we're going. Understand, as he pointed out, that what you're going to do is you're going to give up your right to drive forever. You're going to give up your freedom to drive forever. And understand that it is a partnership between the people in Silicon Valley who are selling you this illusion and the government that wants to control and track everything you do and Uber that wants to control, that wants to own all the cars. You're not going to own anything. It's going to be too expensive for you to buy these cars that are hyped up with all this technology. It simply isn't going to happen. And I think the most interesting thing that's coming out of all this is the crony capitalism. 
We talked about that in our report as well, the fact that uh, there's been a lot of articles uh, by various sources. The L.A. Times has talked about how Elon Musk has gotten about $5 billion in government subsidies for his various ventures that he's got going on. Of course, uh, SpaceX is uh, one of those, and he's gotten essentially a monopoly on launching space satellites, and that was very easy to come by. He made some campaign contributions to John McCain and others uh, to the right, grease the right palms, and he got where he wanted to go. They've had nothing but encouragement and support from the Department of Transportation, the Federal Department of Transportation, as well as the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I'll call them NHTSA uh, for short. They have essentially greased the skids for these people. Yet now we see the SEC is investigating Tesla. And it's interesting, I think, because when you look at what happens, and I, I guess uh, Elon Musk is scratching his head and calling a meeting and saying, uh, wait a minute, who is supposed to pay off these guys? Because what we're seeing happening with the Department of Transportation, with NHTSA, is essentially regulatory capture, folks. It's the same thing, big pharma, big agri do to the FDA. Uh, they make sure that their regulators really aren't going to regulate them. They look at it more as a partnership, okay? So that's what we're seeing out of the transportation bureaucracies. But the Security and Exchange Commission is taking a look at this and says, well, wait a minute, you had this um, accident on May 7th, and it was 54 days before this was made public. And in the meantime, there was a lot of stock activity that was going on, okay? So there was this accident, May 7th, where the... Former Navy SEAL was uh, lulled to sleep and to his death by the promise of a safe autopilot car. Uh, that was not reported to NHTSA for nine days. And then NHTSA and Tesla both set on this information uh, for another 43 days. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs upgraded their stock to a buy. Uh, Tesla sold about $1.5 billion worth of stock. They used that to buy, uh, to make an offer of $3 billion to acquire a rooftop solar installer, and so forth and so on. And then finally, on June 30th, 54 days after the accident, NHTSA goes public with the idea, with the information that Tesla had had a crash. Okay, that's the way they have uh, rolled out this timeline. And so now the SEC is saying, well, we want to take a look at this and see if uh, you should have disclosed this to investors when you were making all this money off of the stock market. But what we're going to see is we're going to see the same thing happen with Tesla that we saw happen with Hillary Clinton. It's going to be one standard for everybody else and a different standard for the people who are well-connected. That's what we constantly see. You know, you need to understand that the way the rules of the road are set up, it's a, uh, they take everybody off the road when they come to town with the president, don't they? They shut down the airports, they shut down the highways, and they grease the skids for these people, and that's what we're seeing with these crony capitalists. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're going to talk here about killer robots, the other technology that is coming after us. It's not just the uh, killer self-crashing cars that we've had, uh, three ca crashes from uh, Tesla in the last uh, two months, but also the uh, killer robots that have now we've seen used for the first time here in America in the uh, shooting in Dallas. There's some ethical issues behind that I want to talk about. But before we do, just want to remind you again that we've extended until tonight our specials on Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine, 20% off, as well as InfoWars Select Storable Food, 20 to 40% off. Those specials that were part of our July 4th special are going to be ending tonight again. It's your way to uh, fuel your health and to fuel the info war as we head to these Democrat and Republican conventions. We really appreciate your support. We try to uh, help you as well to show our appreciation by uh, having these sales and extending them, but they're going to end tonight. That's 20% off Survival Shield X2 and 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. Also, we have a new product, the uh, new Go Smile Sonic Pro Teeth Whitening Toothbrush. This is something that uh, Alex's dad is a dentist. He's been practicing for 30 years. He said it's the best teeth whitening system that he has uh, seen. He uses it in his practice. It is essentially three aspects. It's a uh, Sonic uh, a ghost smile sonic toothbrush that vibrates at an average of 27,000 times per minute to give you a super deep clean. It also has a whitening gel, gel and a blue wavelength light technology. It's part of that brush there that kills bacteria in your mouth, 
that causes bad breath and activates the whitening gel. So it's a three-in-one system. Uh, it's uh, something I think is uh, looks very promising. I'm going to try it myself. Uh, and uh, I've got a vibrating uh, toothbrush, but I don't have anything like that uh, gel that uh, whitens teeth and kills bacteria. So that's something I'm going to pick up right now for limited time as a new product. We've got 25% off your second uh, toothbrush system. Your, your second Ghost Smile Sonic Pro system is part of our special introductory offer at InfoWarsStore.com. Take a look at the three-in-one system that we have there. Uh, look at the uh, discount that we have. It is a great system. Again, it's something that uh, uh, that uh, Alex's dad, who's been a dentist for 30 years, has put together. Something that um, I think you'll find very useful. Now, as we're looking at killer robots, and we saw the first one used this last week as part of the shooting. We had a lot of people come out and say, well, okay, we're not going to put any more lives in danger. We've got a guy who is crazy. He's shooting people without reason. He's targeting people because they're white, because they're police. So we're not going to expose anybody else to, um, to be getting shot. Okay, fine. We understand that. But also understand that earlier in the day, we had a guy who was simply exercising his right under Texas law to do open carry. And he was wrongly accused of being one of the shooters. And that's another part of this, okay? If you want to know what's going on, one of the things that, that concerns me about this is the fact that we were told as it was happening that uh, they were getting triangulated, that they had shots coming in from multiple directions, that they believe there were multiple shooters. And now we're told, as always, that it's a lone shooter. You know, when I look at these situations, when I look at these uh, mass murders, I want to know that we got everybody, don't you? Don't you want to know that we got the right person, that we got everybody? Don't you want to know that we followed due process? Instead of having a kind of judge dread process where we allow our police to be judge, juries, and executioners, where they say, I am the law, and they just execute people on the street, Understand what happened with uh, Mark Hughes, okay? He was identified by the police. His picture went out on social media. He said, I just got out of an interrogation room when he talked to CBS uh, just hours after the shooting. He says, I was there for 30 minutes with the police officers lying, saying that they had video of me shooting. He said, that's a lie. They said they have a witness saying I shot a gun. That's a lie. I mean, at the end of the day, the system is trying to get me. And when we look at this, we have to question whether or not we want to allow this precedent to continue. We'll talk more about this on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. We're going to be joined in the next segment by uh, both Alex Jones and then Anthony Gucciardi is going to join us in the studio. Talk about the collapse of society. One evidence of the collapse of society, I think, is the fact that uh, everybody seems to be just fine with the fact that the police used a robot to kill the shooter, because what we have here, let, let's understand this, folks. This truly is the first use of a drone to kill an American on American soil without any due process. Now, we can argue that it was done to save lives, okay? But you have to understand that there is nothing more dangerous than a government that is not held to a legal standard. In the long run, you're going to lose a lot more lives that way. This is a story that was up from the Ron Paul Institute on InfoWars yesterday. And Dallas Drone Wars just came home. And that was essentially the point they made. They said, yeah, it was done with a drone even though it was wheels instead of wings on this particular drone. And as I was talking about before we went to the break, the shooter who was falsely, I'm sorry, the open carry person who was falsely identified as a shooter. And that was a black Dallas protester, Mark Hughes. Went out all over social media. The police said they had, they, they held him for questioning for a half hour and said, we've got pictures of you shooting a gun. He said, they're, they're lying about me. And eventually, they turned him loose. They were just calling the bluff. But you have to ask yourself, how far down the road are we going to go when the police are being attacked like this or there's an urgent need that they will, out of fear or expediency, just shoot someone instead of putting their picture out on social media and saying, this is the shooter? Will they not just kill a future Mark Hughes? That's the point that's made in the article. So during the questioning, they told Hughes they had a video of him shooting people. That was a lie. What if the police had sent a drone to take him out? What will happen in the future? The future Mark Hugheses, who are falsely accused by the police of being in a shooting. Will we come to accept 
murder without a trial. See, part of the problem with this is when we look at all these mass shootings, they're always used to further a political agenda. Wouldn't we like to know that we truly have gotten to the bottom of it, that we truly have gotten the people that were involved in it, that we have an accurate picture of what happened? But understand that this really isn't about race fundamentally. This is about an arms race. This is about the military industrial complex coming home to America. They want the militarized police because it's going to be a profit center for them. The war on terror is a profit center. That was the key profit center they had as they shut down the Cold War. Of course, they started the Cold War up again as well. They're going to be building all of those long-range bombers and missiles again. That's what uh, all this activity in the Ukraine is about, another profit center for that. But they do want that profit center of the war on terror. People who say that we're concerned, uh, and we are concerned, that we're going to have a militarized police, you need to understand the police are already militarized. We've already got the federal government training our police. The question is, is it going to increase? We've had the federal government training the police and rules of engagement, training them to essentially be like Barney Fife, fearful of everything that they see, flaunting their authority, except instead of taking their bullets, they give them a magazine full of bullets and tell them to, once they start firing, to continue to fire until the magazine is empty. Those are the rules of, of engagement that are coming from the federal police. And they're giving militarized vehicles in the name of the war on drugs, okay? It truly is a war. They brought a war to our streets. The war of terror is from them. The war of drugs is from them. It's not going to solve anything. I mean, we even had the Dallas police chief come out and say, we've got to stop asking cops to do so much in this country. He says, every societal failure... We put it on the cops to solve. He talked about drug addiction and all these other things. No, we put it on the government to solve. We think the government should solve everything. And we think the government should use force to solve everything, to make us safe. And so that's why we use the police to do it. He's exactly right about that. But then, of course, he goes on further and he says, you can become part of the solution. Join the police force. <laughs> we'll solve all of your problems. No, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. Is not true. We'll be right back. We have seen attacks on free speech in the United States and Europe in the last few years that are unprecedented in modern history. Only dictators like Hitler tried to do the things we're now witnessing. If you criticize open borders and the Islamic invasion of Europe, they arrest you. Facebook bans you. And now those same activities are starting here. It's time to take the blinders off. We have seen men waving Mexican flags beat up women in California on television and the mayor has come out in the town and said hey they deserved it <laughs> We have seen attacks on free speech that are truly unprecedented and that are racially motivated. I would be against a group of Caucasian men beating up a Hispanic woman just as much as I'm against a group of Hispanic men beating up an innocent white person or the KKK going after an innocent black person or vice versa. I've seen Black Lives Matter full of their vitriol and hate just beat up people. In some cases, folks that aren't even Trump supporters in their hatred, in their built-up victimology of life, that they've got something to prove, and they have a right to be angry and have a chip on their shoulder. And it's all being manipulated by the social engineers. Know your right, know your law. And I promise you, if they go about their burden of, of whatever they said you're doing, you pull your piss out, you bust that. You pull your piss out, you bust that. Because at the end of the day, it's going to be you against them. Yeah. And when we, do, when we move with the Panthers, trust me, when you see me move, I'm moving in violence. Y'all stop clapping. Stop clapping. Stop clapping, because most of y'all folks ain't involved. Real talk. We're tired of walking around here asking y'all to help us. Yeah. No more action. Yeah. We need action. Come on. Take action. I don't give a whether you knock them over, whether you run up on them, whatever you do. You better take action. And now, ahead of Cleveland next week, we have seen riots all over the country, police shot all over the nation. Uh, every few hours it's happening. 
at courthouses and highways from Michigan to Georgia, from Tennessee to Texas. And we see the White House and the Justice Department, Loretta Lynch, come out and say, you better listen to to Black Lives Matter. We've seen Hillary say, better listen up. I'm going to be talking to white people. Uh, I think we're the ones who have to start listening right. to the legitimate cries that are coming from our African-American fellow citizens. This is a woman that overthrows countries and puts ISIS in charge to murder hundreds of thousands of Christians. This is a woman that gets $100 million from Saudi Arabia and, 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 and more from Gulf states where they totally enslave women. These are the biggest damn hypocrites the world's ever seen. But you got a bunch of trendies that don't care about what's right. They want to just say they're liberal and feel good about themselves and see a great agenda of evil foisted on the planet. I'm going to Cleveland because of these bullies. I've said for months I'm going, and I'm going. And I'm going to be there with rallies and live events, standing up for free speech and standing up for what's left of this country. The whole Republican establishment, along with the Democrats, has been trying to block our rallies. We've sued them twice. They failed. They've been trying to keep Trump from getting the nomination. They have pulled out the stops with lies and disinformation because they want the prize that is America, that they've already sold out. They've already shipped our jobs to China. They've already set up tariffs and systems that ensure we can't compete. We're run by traitors, and they can't believe we're starting to wake up like folks did in the U.K. with the Brexit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is history happening right now. We're covering it right here in InfoWars. And it's more important than ever that you realize history is happening. And what develops here in the next few months is going to change the course of history for good or for bad. But I'm not going to sit there and watch a bunch of brainwashed, government-funded, George Soros-supported thugs run around and attack men, women, and children in the hopes of intimidation. A lot of people watch what different socialist groups are doing, what Bernie Sanders groups are doing, what Black Lives Matter are doing. They say, that's crazy. That discredits them. It's horrible what they're doing. And that's because you're from a perspective of supporting free speech. But for a lot of the young people in this country and a lot of the people raised by MTV, they think anything's okay as long as you say you're liberal. And they think it's cool to support wars, torture, Islamic mutilization of women, Islamic, you know, just absolute sexual genocide. They support all of it because it isn't about actually empowering humanity. It's about them claiming they have the moral high ground in dominating and controlling language and culture and everything else. It's time to get aggressive. It's time to get in these people's faces. It's time to not associate with people you've put up with over the years who claim they're liberal, but then tell you you're bad because you're pro Second Amendment. I'm so sick of all these Hollywood people that make all these movies where they're badasses with guns and shoot all these folks. They've got bodyguards in real life, but they don't want us to own guns. I'm going to start more and more calling out all the so-called Hollywood badasses that are nothing but establishment whores that want to disarm the people. Now I'm going to start calling out other frauds as well, and it's time for you to do it because. They're part of a globalist takeover, and they sense they're with the power structure, and they think by going along with it, they somehow have power. They don't realize they're useful idiots who will be thrown to the side. History shows that. Look, if you want to deny this country's being strangled, if you want to deny that the globalists are breaking this country's will and turning us against each other, that's fine. Let your chains set lightly upon you, as Patrick Henry said, but as for me... I want to know the whole truth and make preparations for it. And as for me, give me liberty or give me death, because being a slave is worse than death. Now back to the live transmission, David Knight, Anthony Gucciardi, and the rest of the crew in Austin, Texas. Lord willing, I'll be back to live tomorrow in studio for what we call the Info War. And that was Alex Jones, and I'm David Knight here in studio with Anthony Gucciardi. I want to get Anthony's take on what's happening now with the as we're brought to the brink of a race war, as well as um, calls for further federal control and militarization of the police. You know, Anthony, I was looking at the comments from the girlfriend of the guy uh, who was uh, shot, uh, Philando Castile. She, she filmed him as he was dying. You know, we can argue all these statistics about who is more victimized by this or white people or black people. You know, in terms of absolute numbers, there's more white people killed, but in terms of percentage, it's a much higher percentage of black people who are killed, so forth and so on. 
Uh, Washington Post took Mike Huckabee to task on that. He came back to them. And he says, well, I guess you could say male lives matter because 94% of the people who are killed are males. So we could try to, to, to divide it down by that. But to me, it's a much more fundamental problem. Because one of the things that she said was she said, if we can't turn to our higher power, you know, officers and things of that sort, then who are we going to turn to if the people that are supposed to be protecting us are the ones that are assassinating us? And when I look at that, it's like, if you're going to just passively turn yourself over to a government and think that it's going to protect you, you have to understand that if you lean on the government and use it as a crutch, you're going to find out that it's a stick that's going to break and pierce your hand. And I think that's what people are finding out, but they haven't come to that conclusion. They're still blaming it on race. You know, I think if we were a doctor, if we were both doctors looking at the United States, looking at America, and we were to make a diagnosis, this is all just a symptom, right? A good mm -hmm. doctor, if you came in with, let's say, you know, boils on your hands or, or hives on your face or something, he wouldn't just say, oh, well, that's hives. He would say, what's causing the hives? What did you do? What did you eat? You know, something, something's going on. There's an internal root issue. This is just balled up anger and hatred and frustration. And I've got a ton of articles printed out today about some of these statistics. People are pissed off. They're so, much, they're so angry. They're just full of rage and hatred because the government has completely shut them out. The establishment has completely screwed them. Mm -hmm. They bought into the lie. Everybody, not just Black Lives Matter, everybody. Uh, everyone has, at one point or another, uh, society as a whole has bought into this lie. It's bought into this system. Psychology Today has a great article about, is society manufacturing depressed and angry people? I mean, all of this is just a symptom of the fact that our society has been duped. It has been But tricked. as you point out all the time, we talk about health issues. Typically, that's what we see the doctors doing, is addressing the symptoms. Exactly. So, you know, treating the outbreak rather than getting to the root cause of it. Well, as above, yeah. so below. Sometimes in a micro level, we can see things that apply to a, a meta level, right? So this, it stuck out to me today, specifically these two articles side by side. You have to, you have, to have some humor sometimes, but think about this. So one says, what ec economic recovery? 62% of Americans don't even have $1,000 in savings. Okay, so think about the average person. Uh, Sixty-two percent don't even have a thousand dollars in savings. But then, that's next to this headline from CNN Money: Stocks have never been higher. It says the Dow is higher than it's ever been before, and it's like a celebratory thing. The it Dow didn't want to recover from Brexit, did it? Yes, yeah, it's, it's like well, one week on its back. But, but the juxtaposition higher. here is absurd. The Dow gained over one hundred twenty points and hit eighteen thousand three fifty-three on Tuesday, surpassing the previous record set in May twenty fifteen. And I, you know, the the economists are saying this is a the, econ uh, the economy is recovering, it's rebounding, this is so powerful, we're having this economic rebound. Meanwhile, 62% of Americans don't have $1,000 in savings. So you can see now the disconnect just at this micro level, right? Where there's people walking around, 62% don't have $1,000. That's going to make them upset. Not to mention, you know, we can get into more of this too when we come back from the break, but Americans work more than anyone, more than the English, more than the French, the Germans, Norwegians. They take less vacation, work longer days, make less money. And now China's middle class is surpassing American middle class in savings. I mean, it's, you, it's insane. There's no way people are not going to hit the boiling point. It's like if you poured gasoline all over a house mm -hmm. and there's just people walking by, uh, I mean, for days and days watching the gasoline sit there. Someone's going to throw a match on it. And that's the mainstream media. The, the lens, the focus is on things like, uh, you know, the, the police and all this. This is just a symptom of the root issue. Not that there's not real discrimination and real horrible things going on. There certainly is. But the media focuses that rage into something. That's like, right. And they use it to exacerbate the condition. And as Gerald Salenti has always said, when people lose everything, they lose it. And that's what we're about to see here. We're going to be right back. I'm David Knight with Anthony Gucciardi. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here with Anthony Gucciardi in the studio. We're just talking about the two different Americas, I guess you could say. It's a, a meme that people have talked about. The essence that the uh, investor class has basically played uh, things like the Brexit to make a great deal of money, haven't they, uh, Anthony? You know, they have a, they thrive off of markets that go radically up and radically down. And if they can come up with a rationale to make that happen, that's when they make their money. They don't make any money when everything goes sideways. And they're making a lot of money off of this. Meanwhile, as you point out in the last segment, most Americans uh, have, what, less than $1,000 to uh, tie them over. So... Most people are not really prepared for the kinds of challenges that we're likely to face. We're seeing things getting very volatile. 
Uh, we've had people talking about a summer of chaos coming up. It's about to begin this next week. We've had uh, Black Lives Matter and other groups saying they're going to shut down these two political conventions. We're going to be there. You can help to fuel our reports with the InfoWar, as well as to provide for your health with these specials that we've extended. We've got 20% uh, still off of Survival Shield X2. Uh, that's going to end tonight. That's uh, nascent iodine. Also ending tonight is 20 to 40% off InfoWar Select Storable Food. That's a very key way to provide for yourself and your family in these times of uncertainty. Make sure that you're going to be protected not only against uh, disruptions in the food supply, but also against massive price increases that could also come through. We've had uh, reports uh, that have come out. It was the uh, food chain reaction was the simulation that they were running. They were saying, well, what happens if we have this kind of input or that kind of input? What happens to food prices and to the supply chain? And, of course, the types of inputs that they were modeling in the report are precisely the types of things that we see them doing now. So you want to protect yourself against that kind of uncertainty and, and not being able to afford food. Make sure that you've got uh, something set there that is a, a backup in case there is a shock to the food chain. Uh, they call it a food chain reaction, the, uh, survive, the um, simulation there. We have 20 to 40 percent off InfoWars Select Storable Food. That is Storable for 25 years, all made in America, GMO-free, and some of the best packaging you'll find and the best discount you're going to find anywhere. And that's going to end tonight. 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food, as well as the 20% off Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. We have to end those sales tonight. You'll find that at InfoWarsStore.com. Well, Anthony, uh, certainly as we're getting close to these conventions, uh, everybody's wondering what's going to happen. I mean, we're, we're seeing everything hyped up on both sides. Both sides are really doubling down. We do have some real problems in what we're asking the government to do, what we're asking the police to do. I believe there needs to be some serious reform, but they're giving us the wrong solutions. They're telling us to consolidate power more, to let government do even more. And I think that's exactly the opposite of what we need. Meanwhile, you've got the people with Black Lives Matter who have been fed with this uh, educational system that's been manipulated by people like um, Obama's mentor, Bill Ayers, uh, to just focus strictly on racism. And they're doubling down. So now we've got these two forces coming to a head. What, what happens at this point? Well, you know, it's really easy to misguide people that are super angry i mean you've dealt with mm -hmm. extremely angry people where you know think about movies and stuff when the main character makes a bad decision because they're so angry you know they have some some resent in there or something like that just unfiltered hatred and the media has a magnifying glass just like you can use a magnifying glass on the sun to hit something unfiltered hatred unfiltered rage people are mad i mean 62 percent of people have less than a thousand dollars in their bank account they're overworked they're depressed uh people now are more depressed than ever Mm -hmm. They see the news. They see the news, the juxtaposition that stocks have been higher than ever. And they see things like this. Uh, HSBC avoided U.S. money laundering charges because of, quote, market risk fears, which actually meant that the U.S. said, well, you know, if we went after the banks for what they did, it could it could impact the global economy. It could cause a global disaster because we need the banks. And interestingly enough, Loretta Lynch and FBI Director Comey were both part of the justice system that uh, gave them a pass at that point in time. Yeah, yeah <laughs> of course, people. Right. So yeah. they see the they, they see the scam. They see mm -hmm. the big joke. They see uh, the FBI director saying everything's fine. They see all this stuff and they're mad. They're pissed off. Uh, unfiltered rage. Now the difference is, you see, in some countries, some scenarios throughout history, you see where they're mad at one thing. Right? They're mad at one leader. They're mad at one politician. They're mad at one other country. Uh, what well, you know, whatever it is. We're just mad, period. <laughs> America is just mad, period. So what happens when you're just full of rage is someone can direct you pretty easily, right? If let's say on a personal level, someone did something to your family or something, you could say, well, you know, it's those people, it's those people. And you might go after them because you're not very reasonable when you're mad. And these statistics that we're going to get into show people are mad. They are madder than ever. They're more angry than ever. And then the media says, oh, it's this. This is what you should be mad about. Yeah, they try and to the redirect that. Says, this is what you should be mad about. And it filters it. It focuses it like a laser beam. And that's well, they know that mad. everybody in Western civilization is getting upset with the raw deal we get. That's why they call it the precarious. We'll march. be right back. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight in studio with Anthony Gucciardi. And we're talking about, I guess we're talking about the precarious, aren't we? It's what uh, Bilderberg was concerned about. You were talking about the different financial metrics that we see here. The fact is, 
the vast majority of the populations in Western countries are seeing their standard of living stagnate or decline. Meanwhile, the few elite are doing really, really well, and they're looking at this and saying, hey, we have a precarious proletariat. How can we control them? I know. We can put them on welfare. We can do to them what we have done to the Indians on the reservation, to black people in the inner city. We've had the same libertarian economists like Charles Murray, who wrote the book Losing Ground, they used for uh, welfare reform in the Reagan administration, saying, look, the welfare system is destroying the black family. This is not helping them. Now he's coming out and supporting a universal basic income as a way to pacify everyone in the society. Well, you know, you said it really well before we went to break. You said, basically, people are served a bad deal. And what happens is the person that served them the bad deal, the system, rather, that served them the bad deal, says, it's not, it's not my fault. It's your fault. Yeah. You know, it's the people looting the economy. It's the people, the point zero 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 one percent of people that are in the financial industry, working with the banks, in the bank systems, destroying the economy in one way or another, 2008 times, you know, multiple times throughout history, over and over and over again, doing these illegal things. The government saying, oh, it's fine. We don't want to go after the banks. Those people doing all of this, uh, the average person, 62%, more than half, has less than $1,000 in their bank account. They're working more than ever. They are depressed. They're angry. I mean, BBC says, why are Americans so angry? Americans are generally known for having a positive outlook on life, it says. I, I didn't know that. But with the countdown for November's presidential election now underway, polls show voters are angry. The CNN ORC poll carried out in December 2015 suggests that 69%, almost 70% of Americans are either, quote, very angry or somewhat angry about the way things are going in the United States. 70% mm -hmm. of the United States is well, angry Well, you know, we've gotten a country. bad deal. Why wouldn't they be? Yeah, I know, am. We know we've gotten a bad deal. should be 100%. Deal. Yeah, look well, at NAFTA, okay? We were told, hey, this is going to destroy your economy, okay? Ross Perot said, giant sucking sound. Donald Trump was talking about it 20, 30 years ago. And now we've looked at it and we've seen exactly what it did immediately as it went in. We had roughly a trade parity with Mexico, for example. It shot up to a $15 billion a year deficit. It's never been less than that, okay? And so we're losing a massive amount of jobs and all this other income. We're told that free trade is great because you can get other people like people in China to work for you for free. So why wouldn't you let them work for you free? They always sell you the easy path. We're going to make you comfortable. We're going to make you safe. We're just going to take your ability to earn money. We're going to take your freedom, your liberty, and your independence. They use the buzzwords. And I, I've always said, we are failing. We are losing. We are being taken advantage of because of our lack of understanding of the details. So what you just said, what you just said in about 30 seconds, you hit on multiple different points. That was all details, right? So details are hard. Mm -hmm. Details are really hard because people, number one, I'll give them some credit. They are working all day. Their lives can be pretty bad. People are depressed, people are angry, people have problems. They come home, they watch television. They don't get to watch shows like this, or they don't choose to watch shows like this, rather. The content they consume is junk. It's cheese whiz equivalent of content. They're they just want to escape. Home. They just want to escape, escape. reality. And what happens is you have the so-called sausage makers, you know, the people in the kitchens, the mainstream media, they come out and they don't say, well, hey, let's go after these people. Let's talk about HSBC. Let's talk about why Americans are frustrated. Let's talk about Black Lives Matter protesters killing cops as a symptom of frustration. Let's talk about the actual specific things. Let's talk about, you know, the fringe people, the radicals, the craziness, because not everyone in Black Lives Matter is bad. No, that's all details. That's not good enough. It has to be, this is it. A or B, black or white, race, whatever. It's simple. It's, it's simple, 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 so served on a silver platter for that person to just gobble up mm -hmm. because they don't have the capacity at that point because they're all stressed out. They're not having the right content choices. They're eating junk. They feel like junk. They're depressed. They're upset. All it takes for the mainstream media is to say, here's a little nibblet. You know, here it is served up on a platter. This is why you're mad. Well, a good example of this is the solution, quote unquote, that's being offered to us by the media, by the government. And that is, well, you know, you need to have federal control over the police. They never talk about having more local control. They never even talk about, let's say, privatizing the police. We've got an article about that on Infowars.com. I mean, that would be an interesting idea that we could talk about the different ways that we could structure it. Changing the mission of the police so that they're not focused on generating revenue with petty fines, different things like that. But they won't talk about that. They already have, as you pointed out, uh, the choice that they're going to offer you when they create the problem. Problem, solution. Here's a solution we've already worked out, and the solution is going to be more of the same.
And, and you know, the police confiscate like a hundred plus million dollars in, in, I think it's Arkansas or something. There's craziness. But my question is, yeah, number one, because remember, we lose on the details. If I don't say the, the details, we will lose. There is real discrimination. Um, most police officers, it, it appears, I mean, considering there's plenty of them, uh, are genuinely good intentioned people. Uh, I've been mistreated by the police in my past, but I don't hold it against every police officer. I've been mistreated by white people, black people, all, all types of people. And I don't hold it against every single person that is that type. Uh, that's discrimina uh, discrimination in and of itself to say all cops are bad. I, I appreciate what the police do for me, just as I appreciate what other people do for me. But is it even about the police is what I'm saying. Is it even about the police? I don't know. I mean, when you have, this is uh, a good article, 19 numbers which prove that Americans are angrier and more frustrated than ever. So you have 70% of Americans do not feel engaged or inspired at their jobs. 77% of Americans believe the state of the economy is not good or poor. 65% of Americans say they're somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the overall direction of the country. And we just saw another one, 69%. Only 4% of Americans believe that it would change Congress for the worst if every member was voted out during the next election. <laughs> now, think about that. Every member of essentially what makes the decisions in this country to be gone, 4% say that would be bad. So if 96% <laughs> Six percent of people say if we got rid of every single politician in Congress, it would probably be better. And yet the mental illness is that they want to turn over more decisions in their life to other people. To That's take care the of. mental illness, yeah. because they say 96 percent say Congress is terrible. The government's not helping. Sixty nine percent say we're not satisfied with the direction of this country. The government is overbearing. Sixty percent so they're angry and irritable. Uh, Sixty five percent. They're dissatisfied with the U.S. system of government, period. Right. But then what's the solution? More federal control of the police, more federal control of this, higher minimum wage. We need more federal spending. We need sustenance of all levels from the government teat. Instead yeah. of saying, wait a minute, that is what did it. So you can't go back to, you can't, what broke you is not going to fix you. That's right. But and, that's and we the have, mental illness. We do it all in our personal lives too. Whatever broke you, you oh, that's going to fix me. You go back and back and back because we're a reliant population now. We're that's reliant. Right. That's right. People don't value their freedom, their independence. It's this kind of mental illness that uh, Alex was talking about with Pokemon Go, okay? They just want to be distracted. <laughs> they want to have, if you look at the like self-driving into like classified yeah. bases looking <laughs> looking for uh, the Pokemon. Like, that's going to be, that's going to happen. I, I know that's going to happen, yeah. But, you know, you look at the, the situation with these you know, self-driving cars, I want to call it. 90% of the people in New York and California want to give up that control of their life. They don't want to have the freedom and the independence of movement that we've historically had. They want to be taxed and tracked and prevented from moving if they haven't uh, paid all of their bills or whatever. For whatever reason, the government wants to do that. They want something else to even move them from place to place. How pathetic is that? But see, that's the, that's the details, man. They're yeah. serving on a, a donut on a silver platter saying, you can sleep while you drive. Yeah. Doesn't matter about the taxes. No, no, no. You can sleep. While you drive, you yeah. can go on your laptop. You can play Pokemon Go on your phone right. while you are driving. <laughs> All right, that's that's how they sell it. I'm and serious. While it drives you under a semi trailer, yeah, uh, while it drives yeah. you under takes uh, off your head, right a bridge there. or whatever. You yeah. know, I mean, innovation is good, but no one thinks about the de details. Like I said, and that's why everyone is depressed. And then they say, oh, you know, all these I have endless articles, endless articles. Americans are more depressed than decades ago. Why are they so angry? Why are they so frustrated? Why are more people killing themselves than ever? And then, oh, three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. I wonder what it is for the US. Kids aren't even allowed to go outside anymore. I mean, they're so sheltered. And then people are also upset and depressed because their standards are so off and different and absurd, they're obscure. I mean, they're so worried about microaggressions and being upset and being offended by someone's free speech that they go into a tussle, they go into a rage. I mean, think about it. Old school version of this would be a bear is killing you and you're into a freak out rage or like invaders are coming to kill your entire village and slaughter your family and, and rape your women and you go into a rage. Now it's someone said something that's a microaggression online. That is the same systemic response biologically that we're having now. We've changed. We've upgraded. We've become sloth creatures that sit around and yeah. have nothing real to be worried about because we're not focusing on the real issues. We just want to create little things to be upset about that are total distractions and total ridiculousness. And then we're forced here on this program where we want to talk about real stuff. We want to talk about 
the, the banks making billions and billions of dollars on taxpayer money after they swindled everybody and screwed everybody and the government says they can't do it because there could be market risk fears. So we want to talk about that stuff, but guess what? Now we got to battle this stuff. We got to battle the fake political correctness. We got to battle the microaggression police. We got to battle. I mean, we're saying we're, we're bad for saying that it's not good to kill police officers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. absurd. I made a post about that, about the police saying, you know, there's some discrimination, but it's good to support uh, the police officers that do good. And people would say things truly like kill the police. Um, they said all pigs are bad, you know, stuff like that. I'm talking about 20, 30 people saying really, really bad death threats. Well, it's not even a it's connection absurd. to the... If they don't even believe that. It's just raw, unfiltered rage. It's not even a connection to the same police department or the same city that had the things that they're upset about. I mean, they're, they're going after totally innocent people. And as this guy said, he's going after these people simply because they're police or simply because they're white. And that's the kind of mental illness that we see happening here. <laughs> it all goes back, I think, to the fact that people are just looking at ways to spend their time and not to invest their time. They're not looking at where, what they want to do with their lives, preparing a better life for their children. You know, as, as you were talking earlier about China, you're saying the middle class has grown twice as fast as that in the United States. They're, they're seeing an increase in the standard of living. That's not to say that their absolute uh, wealth is, is better than ours at this point, but they see things that are gradually improving. That makes you happy. That gives you dreams. That gives you goals. It gives you a future that you can look into. And they're making things, okay? Now, some of them are making things under yeah, slave labor right conditions, here. and that's not a good thing. But, but they're creating wealth because manufacturing has been moved over there. Meanwhile, we've got the people who are selling free trade telling us, hey, these people work for free. They'll work as your slaves. Why not use them? And then we wind up in this service economy where we're just doing each other's laundry. We're not creating a future. We're just living off of our current status. But then it even goes from that. We had Gary Johnson talking about, yeah, well, you know, free trade is great because of that. And, and you know, we got these clean service industries. But the future is Uber, the gig economy, where you're going to not own anything. You're not even going to have a full-time service job. You're going to have this precarious position. That's where the precariat are. You have this precarious position where you know the guy who's running Uber wants to own all vehicles and he doesn't want to have any employees. So you're going to go into <laughs> this temporary job, which is super temporary because it has absolutely no future. And, and people think they're, they're getting the bad end of the deal now. People yeah. have accepted a bad deal. It's true. And you, you got that Chinese, uh, the uh, article about the Chinese economy right here. It says the uh, Chinese savings network ranges from 50000 to 500000 The momentum gained traction in 2000. Since that time, China's middle class has grown at twice the U.S. rate. These numbers are quite shocking when you consider the average worker in the U.S. does not even have $5,000 in savings. And earlier we talked about mm -hmm. that. 62% mm -hmm. of less than 1000 So, I mean... Because if you don't make anything, you're not going to... Uh, if you lose your manufacturing capability, not only do you become dependent on other countries, you've got to buy... Uh, your manufactured goods, even for your military. Got it's to buy impossible them. to buy yeah. anything these days that's exactly. not from China. And even at a uh, large level, business to business level, right? When I'm looking at stuff to buy, like real products, even the uh, manufacturers that we work with and stuff, they all say it's almost impossible to avoid China now because they have a monopoly on the entire system. And we are weird because we say, well, we don't want the Chinese stuff. And mm -hmm. they're like, well, it's mm -hmm. way less, way less money. I mean, you're going to make way more money. Say, no, we, we don't want it, actually. Um, you know, in terms of a hat or something, you know, every now and then, that's fine. I'm talking about something you're going to ingest in your body. You know, they'll say, yeah. well, well, this version of the, uh, you know, vitamin C or whatever from China is way cheaper. It's way better. It's high quality. No, it's not. I know what it is. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, it gets back to the point where if you get all your hats from China, then who's going to buy your products that you make here if you, in fact, make anything? Or if you want to do other people's laundry, what are they going to, how, how are they going to pay you? That's what we see happening now with the robot economy. That's going to replace and disrupt everything, both horizontally and vertically. It's going to affect every industry horizontally. It's going to affect every different level, from blue-collar to the top white-collar jobs. It's going to be incredibly disruptive, and it's really going to create a precariat, okay, that is multi-class based and throughout all these different industries. It's precisely what they have done to us with China. And we look at China and we say, well, I don't want to work under these slave labor conditions where people are committing suicide. They got to, uh, you know, have suicide nets out there in the Foxconn uh, uh, factories and everything. It's horrible living conditions. But, you know, quite frankly, it's a step up for these people from the conditions that they were under under Chairman Mao. Okay, so now we've got 
socialism being sold to us, as well as a decline in our standard of living. It's a very bleak process if we don't get control of things. I think that's one of the key things when we look at Donald Trump, the idea that we are going to put America first, that we're going to start to reclaim our independence. One of the things to do that is to have tariffs. You know, we got rid of, we used to run our country when it was constitutional size on tariffs alone. Thomas Jefferson bragged about the fact that nobody internally in America knew a tax man. That's what he said in his second inaugural, because they could fund the entire government simply on tariffs. When we got the income tax, okay, when we uh, got all that put in, they changed the tax structure. They gave us the income tax. They cut the tariffs. They gave us the Federal Reserve. That's when everything changed in 1913. It's been a Awful system for us for the last 100 years. Well, you know, earlier we were talking about if you were a doctor and you looked at America as a country and you give a diagnosis, you wouldn't just look at the symptoms, the root issue. I think a doctor, a psychiatrist, a well-trained psychiatrist would look at America and say that America has a mental sickness. Mm -hmm. Truly, I mean, Very schizophrenic. Think, schizophrenic. <laughs> think about what you just said. So you were talking earlier, you know, people say that, for example, OK, a cop uh, potentially discriminated and killed a black person. OK, kill cops. Wait, what, wait, what? And then you say, you know, um, America's economy is bad. Okay, ship everything to China. Mm -hmm. it, everything that we do, it seems, is a complete insane reaction. Like the banks are looting everything. Oh, we need to tax more of the, the lower income people. Yeah. It's, it's like, or, oh, the 0.0001% is destroying the world. And then some of the population says, all rich people are bad. <laughs> wait, wait, what? Uh, wealth is bad. People that own businesses are bad. They need to pay more taxes. It's all just insanity, almost at every single level of it. Uh, yeah. Clearly, there's there's sane people, but stuff like this is going to creep up because when you're you're focused on the insanity, stuff like this is going to creep up. World food prices post biggest rise for four years in June. We've talked about this quite a bit before, but world food prices posted their biggest monthly rise for four years in June. Uh, buoyed by a surge in sugar and increase for most other edible commodities, the UN Food Agency said on Thursday. So as we're busy just being crazy and being freaked out of all this kind of stuff, food prices are rising, the economy is shifting, things are actually happening, they're important. But again, we lose the details. Absolutely. Too busy. David Knight with Anthony Gucciardi. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Paul Joseph Watson. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight with Anthony Gucciardi. We're going to uh, talk a little bit here about the uh, convention coming up. And uh, as part of that convention, InfoWars, of course, is going to be covering both of the conventions. It's going to be quite a fight inside and outside of the convention, I think. Although we saw Bernie Sanders uh, bury the hatchet with Hillary Clinton today. He doesn't have a problem with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, he just wants her to uh, win at this point. But we still have Republicans who are fighting Donald Trump. We're going to be there covering it. One of the ways that you can support us, of course, is to buy the products that you'll find at InfoWarsStore.com, at InfoWarsLife.com. We try to offer you the very best products we can at the very best price we can. And periodically, we discount them even further as a an appreciation. And we have a sale that's going to be ending tonight, 20% off Survival Shield X2. That's our nascent iodine, as well as 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. This is a way for you to be able to support yourself, to support your family, to provide for yourself as well as to provide for InfoWars, to give us the fuel that we need to go cover these important events as they're coming up. Again, those sales are going to end tonight. That's 20% off Survival Shield X2 Nason Iodine and 20 to 40% off InfoWars Select Storable Food. We also have a new product that's come out this week. Uh, this is something that, Dal uh, the, uh, that Alex's dad, who's been a practicing dentist for 30 years, said it's the best teeth whitening system that he has seen in his 30 years of practice, it's a three-way system. It uses a sonic toothbrush that vibrates an average of 27,000 times a minute for a very deep clean, as well as a whitening gel and a blue wavelength technology. Now, the blue wavelength technology activates that whitening gel. It also kills bacteria. It's a great system. Take a look at it at InfoWarsStore.com. For a limited time, you can get nearly 25% off your second Go Smile Sonic Pro system. It's part of our exclusive listener special at InfoWarsStore.com. Anthony, we were talking during the break about uh, Jeb making his first statements for quite some time. at the Close to uh, the convention starting this next Monday, he had, I thought, a couple of interesting things to say. He said that he would be very sad if Trump was elected. He would be very worried. And yet, he says, if Hillary is elected, he'll feel vindicated. 
No regrets there for Jeb. He doesn't have our best interest at heart. He has his political career at heart, doesn't he? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it did remind me of the story that we're talking about in the break because uh, this individual actually also lost 90% uh, of his brain. <laughs> Yes, that sounds like Jeb, and, doesn't it? Uh, so it, this, this is a very interesting story to close out with. So it says, a civil servant missing most of his brain challenges our most basic theories of consciousness. So this guy had a uh, like Jeb, yeah. had a medical condition, and 90% of his brain was destroyed. But he's still walking around as a married father of two and a civil servant doing his own thing. I mean, he's just... So he's functioning he's better fine. than Jeb. So he's I wonder what percentage Jeb is lost. He's functioning way better than Jeb Bush. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I actually think he sh Jeb should hire him uh, as a, an advisor. But uh, if you look at the picture on the article, basically pretty much all his brain is gone. And they thought for sure he would just kind of be a, you know, a vegetable, a brain dead or whatever. And it took 30 years for this to happen, fluid build up in his brain and stuff, but he's totally fine. He has, he has a lower than normal IQ for sure. It's very low. Um, I don't know. It doesn't specify if he was born that way or not, but he's walking around as a father of, of two kids with his 90% of his brain missing. So it's wow. very interesting. It changes everything we know about what is consciousness and self-awareness and everything like that. So. Well, we don't know what Jeb's IQ is, but we can take some educated guesses. Uh, yeah. This headline well, from... And for the record, I think we should elect this person as president. <laughs> That's right. From Breitbart says, Jeb says, conservatism is temporarily dead, and the Pope's border mass fueled Trump. You know, Jeb is temporarily dead, and especially if he doesn't realize that the Pope's open borders hurt him, what does he think open borders that he was pushing did for him. I mean, that was a central part of what he was pushing. Stay with us. Paul Joseph Watson is going to be back for the fourth hour. I'm Anthony, we're Anthony Gucciardi and David Knight. Thanks. We are back live. This is the fourth the hour of the Alex Jones Show with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson. I will be with you for the next hour, and I'll be joined at the bottom of the hour by transgender YouTube commentator Blair White. Now, she uploaded, she posted a video that was critical of Black Lives Matter. And just wait until you hear about the hatred, the harassment that she received as a result. She was doxxed. Her address was revealed. Her family was targeted by these Black Lives Matter extremists. But CNN told me, Sally Cohn told me that this was a peaceful group. Surely this can't be. We're going to talk to Blair White at the bottom of the hour. But again, we've seen this narrative after Dallas over and over again. I'm going to delve more into it after the break that Black Lives Matter is just a peaceful group. How many videos, how many Facebook posts, how many actual violent attacks on cops, on other people, do we have to see before we change this narrative that Black Lives Matter is a peaceful group? Police officers in St. Paul, Minnesota, having concrete blocks dropped on their head. That happened on Saturday. Officer suffered a fractured spine, throwing fireworks at police officers, rallying up protesters saying we need to bust a cap in police officers, we need to run them down, we need to run up on them. We've got more news about this today, I'm going to get into it more after the break, but the Indy Channel is reporting IMPD officers house shot five times man in custody. This was a Black Lives Matter supporter, got out of his vehicle, yelled F the police and shot at this officer's house and car with his 10-year-old son in the house. Again, this is a peaceful group, of course. Don't forget, Sally Cohn, CNN, told me. This is out of the Detroit News. Detroit police arrest four for threats against cops. Detroit police arrested four men for allegedly threatening on Facebook to kill police officers. One of the men reportedly posted, quote, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Kill all white cops. But again, Black Lives Matter is a peaceful group. CNN told me. Sally Cohn told me. In fact, Sally Cohn told me that she hadn't seen anyone from Black Lives Matter, anyone sympathetic with Black Lives Matter, celebrating or justifying the attack on the Dallas police officers. Really? Really? <laughs> you can go on Twitter at any minute of the day and see people celebrating this attack. Go on to Twitter right now and chant in pigs, cops, Black Lives Matter. You will see thousands of people every single day celebrating these attacks, justifying these attacks. Because as the El Paso police chief said the other day, this is a domestic hate group. If you had a bunch of 
you know, right-wing Christians who said that their ideological inspiration was the Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh and that they wanted to kill all black people. They marched in major cities chanting to kill all black people. They posted it on Facebook and Twitter, we want to kill all black people. They violently attacked black people. Imagine if that was the situation. How would the media treat it? Would the media venerate such a group as, you know, a bold new protest movement, a bold new frontier in civil rights? Of course not. They would call them violent domestic extremists. We saw that just a few months ago up in Oregon. And those people weren't even violent to begin with. But again, Black Lives Matter, the founders of the organization say that their inspiration, Asata Shakur, is their guru. This is a convicted cop killer who is on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. If right-wingers said that Timothy McVeigh was their inspiration and they were going to act on his message, would the media give them a fair shake? Well, of course not. But the media has built up this domestic hate group. And now, unfortunately, it's leading to more violent attacks. We're going to get into that after the break, as well as talking about the latest on the migrant crisis. Yet another mass molestation, this time in Sweden. We'll be back. This is The Alex Jones Show. Paul Joseph Watson with the fourth hour of The Alex Jones Show. Of course, Bernie Sanders, the quote, anti-Wall Street candidate, has just endorsed the ultimate Wall Street insider, Hillary Clinton. The deadbeat communist Bernie Sanders betrayed all the Bernie bros and sided with the most corrupt corporate politician in America. Well, imagine my shock. Now, the polls have said that they're very inaccurate. They say it could be 55%, in fact, 45% who are going, not going to vote for Hillary, up to 85% who will vote for Hillary in terms of Bernie Sanders supporters. When it comes to the day in question, will those Bernie bros actually cast their vote for Hillary? Well, I think a lot more of them will than those who say they will when asked by pollsters, because, of course, they don't want that dirty little secret to slip out. But when push comes to shove, I think all the Bernie bros will line up behind Hillary Clinton, because if they're so stupid to fall for this socialist rhetoric in the first place, then that tells you that they're easily led. So even though Bernie Sanders has endorsed the most Wall Street friendly politician in America, despite being, quote, the anti Wall Street candidate. I don't think this revolt against Bernie will last for long. On the subject of election news, we've got a big exclusive story on Infowars.com right now. Bush operatives sabotage Trump effort to make release of 28 pages part of GOP platform. Now, of course, people don't realize that the Bush crime family still has a lot of power. Just because George W. Bush has gone half senile and, you know, spends most of his time painting terrible pictures in the bathroom mirror, doesn't mean that the Bush crime family doesn't still have significant power within the GOP, especially with Jeb Bush. So now, according to sources close to the Trump campaign, Trump himself insisted on those 28 pages regarding Saudi Arabian involvement in 9-11 being included on the official GOP platform after next week's convention. And it initially passed, if you read the article, you can read the plank in full, delivering transparency on foreign government ties to 9-11. So it passed a national security subcommittee of the GOP platform, and it went forward to the main committee, but was rejected, according to our sources, after pressure from the Bushes. So that's a big story up on Infowars.com right now. But I wanted to get back into Black Lives Matter because, of course, CNN told me, Sally Cohn told me that it was a really peaceful group, even as they drop concrete blocks on officers' heads, throw fireworks at them, shoot into their houses, threaten to kill white cops on Facebook. It's a peaceful group. People ask me if I get death threats. Yes, I get death threats every day. And I post them on Twitter. Not because I really care, not because I want them to have their accounts deleted. I don't give a damn. But it just gives you an insight into the fact that the tolerant, peaceful left are the most vicious, the most violent. So this was a nice, friendly message I received today. You're a little bitch. You live in London and talk SHIT about African Americans. It's embarrassing that you think cops aren't racist. Hashtag, we the terrorists now. 
and this nice friendly message that I receive ends, you effing bitch, you'll get killed. And that's from a Black Lives Matter supporter, which is a peaceful group because CNN told me so. And again, you see this division that's being created. If you talk out, if you speak out, if you criticize Black Lives Matter, that must mean that you hate African Americans. That must mean you hate black people. It's the same with Islam. If you talk out, if you speak out, if you criticize the ideology of Islam, that must mean you hate Muslims. If you speak out against the ideology of feminism, that must mean you hate women. Well, no, because it's an ideology. Feminism is not a gender. Islam is not a race. And Black Lives Matter is not a color. It's an ideology. So yes, you can criticize it. Yes, you can say it's leading black people down a rabbit hole. It's ensconcing them in this grievance ghetto culture that's partly responsible for the fact that crime rates amongst black people in many areas of America are disproportionately high. And I'm sorry if facts hurt your feeling. If facts hurt your feelings, well, that's a fact. It's a statistic. You can go across the board and see it in every inner city in America. And on that subject, Mark Lamont Hill, this leftist race baiter, was debating a law enforcement analyst, Harry Hook, on CNN. Basically, Hook brought up these statistics that black people are prone to criminality, not because of the pigmentation of their skin, but because of the culture that glorifies criminality, because of this socioeconomic situation pushed by the left that keeps black people in the ghetto, keeps them dependent, keeps them dependent on food stamps, keeps them dependent on welfare. In return for votes, that's why the left wants to keep black people down. We've gone over it again and again. But let's go to these two clips. First, Harry Hook lays out the stats, and then we'll get to the second clip when we come back. Here's the first clip from CNN. When a police officer does do something bad, we have a space to see, to not have other police investigate them, but instead we have civilian review boards, we have citizen review boards. These types of things actually give us the kind of transparency that we need. How real is it that if you were on the job and you knew a guy was dirty, you would be worried about coming forward because what if it's not you know, a clean situation. What if it comes back on you? You know, you need your brothers and sisters uh, within the force to support yourselves. Well, it's an issue, but there is a, there, when I was in internal affairs, we had this thing that was called the action desk. All right. Believe it or not, I think about over half the calls we got were from other police officers, making allegations on police officers doing bad things on the street. But, but let's see, listen, Chris, this isn't a one-sided argument here, okay? We're talking about Three different things here, all about the police department, but facts have got to matter. If we want to make some changes here on what's going on, the police have already recognized the fact that we have some issues that we've got to deal with, all right? Now the black community has got to also understand that they have issues that they have to deal with, all right? This is not a one-way street here. And now, you got police officers, you got the Ferguson effect that we're dealing with today, all right, it's because police officers are second-guessed right away. We have these, the incident in Louisiana and in Minneapolis, okay? We don't know what happened there, okay? Especially what happened in Minneapolis, all right? The investigation is still going on, but to come out with the rhetoric that the police officers were racist when there's no evidence to indicate that racism was involved That's has got has got to stop, all right? If that doesn't stop, and this thing about the, the disparity of blacks and whites in jails, that's got to stop because I got statistics right here which will prove me right. In New York City alone, okay, blacks are 23%. They make up of 75, the population. Right, the population. 75% of all shootings, 70% of all robberies, and 60% of all violent crimes, all right? The whites, only 3%. Now, that is why there were more blacks in jail than there are whites. But that's, okay. okay? And now, now let me just finish here and then, and then go, all right? So we look at that statistic, all right? They turn it around, you know, the racial demagogues out there, turn it around that the blacks are being picked on. It's not. So, so the facts and these statistics, all right, have to be addressed and you've right. got to understand them. But so that's Harry Hook on CNN debating Mark Lamont Hill. And we've got another clip. We might not get a chance to play it, but... He's laying out the facts that black people are more prone to criminality. Mark Lamont Hill comes back. He doesn't try to dispute any of those facts. And in fact, that's 
replicated in a Media Matters article on this issue. Of course, Media Matters being an Obama administration front literally meets with the Obama White House every week to decide who to attack in the media. They can't debate him on the fact. They can't answer the charge that black people are having more violent confrontations with police because they commit more crimes. Objective fact. We've been over it again and again. So what do they do? Mark Lamont Hill comes back and says, I can't believe you're saying black people are more prone to criminality. Harry Hook says, well, they are. Here are the stats. What do you say about the stats? He has nothing to say about the stats. What does he have? He has the word racist. And that's it. He thinks that wins him the debate. Listen, the fact, you know, you can ask the question, are black people in America more prone to criminality than white people? Yes. The facts clearly show that. Does that mean that all black people are criminals? No. But that's not the debate. You know, are Muslims more prone to violence than Christians? Yes. The facts clearly show that. Virtually every terror attack that happens is done by Muslims. The facts clearly show that. Is it because of race? No, Islam isn't a race. Again, that's not the debate. But the left has to make it about race. They have to ignore the facts and just label everyone racist to shut down the debate. Is it about the pigmentation of someone's skin? Is it about culture? Is it about socioeconomics? Well, yes. Young people, young black people, their entire subculture is based around the glorification of criminality, this hip hop gangster culture. And you've had black intellectuals who, of course, are completely panned by the left because they don't tow the dogma, like Thomas Sowell, who have come out and documented this connection between hip hop gangster thug culture and criminality amongst young black people. If that's all they see, if that's what they're told to aspire to, then how do you think they're going to behave? And then you've got the entire socioeconomic morass, which, which black people are ensconced in. Again, it's based around the left keeping black people in the ghetto, keeping them dependent, keeping them on welfare, keeping them on food stamps in return for their votes. They don't care about black people becoming empowered. They don't care about black people becoming self-sufficient. They don't care about black people becoming independent because all they're interested in is getting the vote. That's all they care about. But until we have this conversation on both sides of the equation about police brutality, but also about black criminality and what causes that, we're never going to fix the issue. And merely calling somebody racist is not an answer to the problem. We'll be back on The Alex Jones Show Live. Don't go away, Infowars.com. We're back on The Alex Jones Show Live. After the break, we're going to go to Blair White, popular new transgender YouTube commenter. Commentator, she made a video about Black Lives Matter and was completely harassed, targeted, doxxed, had her family threatened. We're going to get the full story from Blair White, but again, this is a peaceful group. CNN told me, Sally Cohn told me. I'm going to get more into that, but first. Migrants rape, molest women at anti-racism festival in Sweden. It's our old friends, once again, the liberal basket case known as Sweden. This is up on Infowars.com. Women attending an anti-racism music festival in Sweden were raped and molested by migrant men in yet another shocking example of how the West is importing a real rape culture. Now, the police spokesman came out and said that the culprits, surprise, surprise, were, quote, foreign men. So you've got all these Swedish love and light hippies at this music festival, this peace and love festival, out there to enjoy themselves. These are probably the same people that held up refugees' welcome signs. And once again, we have a massive rape scandal on our hands, a massive molestation scandal. Remember last summer in Stockholm, the Swedish police were caught covering up a similar mass molestation. It's happened yet again. How many times does this have to happen before feminists say anything about it? In fact, the organizers of this anti-racism festival, <laughs> they blamed all men. We saw the same thing after Cologne. Again, hundreds and hundreds of women molested en masse New Year's Eve. What did the local feminist groups do immediately afterwards? 
they came out and blamed German men, when in almost every instance the culprits were either newly arrived asylum seekers or supposedly integrated, assimilated migrants who had been there for a couple of years. This isn't a problem with German men. This isn't a problem with Nordic drinking culture, as the Norwegian government came out and tried to claim after they had a similar mass molestation. Now, during this incident, you actually had a woman raped in the middle of the audience, in the middle of a music concert. It's not as if this was happening, you know, off on the sidelines behind closed doors. Right in the middle of this field, a woman is being raped. And again, according to this police spokesman, they used the same tactics that we saw in Cologne. Groups of men crowding around women, distracting them while others grope and molest. But not just groping and molesting in this situation, actual full-on rape. Now, I looked into the uh, place where this happened, Bolange. This is a place that's another one of these Muslim no-go area ghettos. Just two months ago, police, ambulance workers, and even shop workers were being attacked. Cars were being set on fire. This is one of the areas that's enjoyed the bountiful beauties of cultural enrichment since Sweden opened its doors to mass immigration back in the 70s. And in fact, in this article, I linked to the chart for Borlange, this area of Sweden, where you can see the crime rate. And since the late 70s, it's gone straight up as a result of the bountiful cultural enrichment that they've received as a result of mass immigration. Now, I remember even the New York Times, I admitted a couple of days ago, even they reported on the fact, if you read the article, they admit that most of the culprits at these other two mass molestation incidents, again, at music festivals, the Bravala Festival and the Putter Park and Music Festival. In fact, John bounded a video about that, which is on the Alex Jones channel. Again, most of the attackers identified as foreigners. We had the president of the German Federal Crime Police Office out of Cologne admit in an article in USA Today yesterday, and we featured this as well, quote, there is a connection between the emergence of this phenomenon and the rapid migration in 2015. Okay, that's not Pegida saying that. That's not right-wing racists saying that. That's the president of the German Federal Crime Police finally admitting that this is a problem. Are feminists going to admit that large numbers of men coming into the country who treat women as second-class citizens, who treat them as cattle, is that, are they going to acknowledge that as a problem? Or are they going to continue to whine about manspreading and all these other ridiculous Western gynocentric issues which have nothing to do with the fact that women are under threat. We're importing a real rape culture into the West and feminists are absolutely silent on it as women are being attacked and raped over and over again. We'll be back on The Alex Jones Show with Blair White. Don't go away, Infowars.com. We are back. It's the fourth hour overdrive of The Alex Jones Show. Now I just want to draw your attention to Infowarsstore.com. Because this is really how we're changing the narrative. If we didn't have our reporters out at these events, you know, at the Black Lives Matter events, at the Donald Trump rallies, we would never be able to change the narrative. Again, we had this narrative a few months ago that, you know, Donald Trump was responsible for the violence at his rallies. Well, we actually sent people out there with cameras to show you the violent, unhinged left and how they were responsible for the violence. We've been at Black Lives Matter process where we've caught a lot of this on tape, and that's because of your support. That's why we need you to go to InfoWarsStore.com because we're challenging the mainstream media. We're ruining, we're wrecking their narratives simply by having people out there in the field shining a light on all this. So you can go and get the Go Smile Sonic Pro system, the Go Smile Teeth Whitening Gel. Those products are fresh in the InfoWars store. Of course, the Hillary for Prison t-shirt, which has uh, prompted headlines, appeared in news stories nationwide. We've got the uh, one-year supply, the six-month supply of InfoWars Life Select. Again, amazing deals at InfoWarsStore.com. And it's incre incredibly important for you to go and support us because, again, 
We're taking on the mainstream media, and now we're starting to have success. You can see exactly where your money is going when you support us by getting the products at InfoWarsStore.com. Now we're going to go to our guest, who is Blair White, a YouTuber, transgender commentator. You can search Blair White on Twitter or YouTube. Her accounts will come up. And again, when this goes up on YouTube, we'll put the links in the description. Now, Blair, you posted a video about a week ago, I think, called Black Lives Matter is Trash. <laughs> you went straight out there with it, got Shame. in people's faces, basically, with the truth. You know, the video talked about, and in fact, we can see some of it in the background here. You talked about how these Black Lives Matter morons crashed this vigil to the Orlando massacre victims to reinforce their oppression at Olympics hierarchy. And then you basically went through the fact that Black Lives Matter as a movement has completely failed. You know, we got race relations, the worst in modern history. We've got black people still killing each other in droves. Now Black Lives Matter, the ideology is inspiring actual terrorists to go out and kill people. And of course, the big one for me, millions of Americans are now not even interested in police brutality or, or addressing it as an issue because of its association with this colossally stupid, violent, and divisive Black Lives Matter movement. Now, you put out this video. Tell us what was in the video and what happened after you posted it. Okay, so in the video, it was, um, I think it was at Mizzou, and it was a Black Lives Matter activist who hijacked the stage and the microphone to basically advertise Black Lives Matter um, racial demonstrations and say that, the people that were there to mourn the deaths of the 49 people slain in the Orlando shooting were racist, um, implying that they were unintelligent because they were white, and basically just using it to push her own narrative rather than to be respectful for what it was, which was, you know, mourning 49 slain people. It's pretty amazing. And we, we saw the same thing in, I think it was Toronto, Canada, last weekend, where they, again, they hijacked this gay pride march to yeah. reinforce this oppression Olympics, I think there's this fear that, you know, their control of that narrative of gay people in general, of this LGBT community, which you're a member of, is starting to slip away. And those people are being relegated. They're being put up at the bottom of the uh, oppression Olympics hierarchy. And they're trying mm -hmm. to reinforce, again, their supremacy, because Black Lives Matter is a divisive supremacist group, above those people, because, again, they're starting to listen to people like you, people like me. I mean, after Orlando, I got so many positive messages from gay people, from LGBT people, you know, saying yeah. that they were buying guns. They were starting to watch conservative libertarian YouTube videos. They were starting to think about voting for Donald Trump because they're just sick of being yeah. told what to think by the left. So you posted this um, video and then the, the peaceful Black Lives Matter group, Sally Cohn and CNN told me it was peaceful. So I guess it is. They weren't too happy with it. Tell us what happened afterwards. No, you know, unlike when I make a video about, say, feminism, um, where you'll have like two feminists in the comment sections arguing, um, Black Lives Matter is actually very organized. And if they set a target, they're coming for a target. And basically what happened was one prominent Twitter in the Black Lives Matter I don't know, community, um, shared my video. And then from there, it was just like they descended, which is totally fine because I make videos to encourage, you know, discourse and disagreement and everything. Um, but no one really challenged the ideas in my video. They just kind of made, you know, ad hominem attacks. And eventually a Twitter um, got a hold of me. They're a doxing Twitter. And on their timeline, they had docs, like dozens and dozens of people, including their addresses, phone numbers, um, other information, employers, and were encouraging people to actually go to their homes and enact violence upon them. So at that point, I decided to kind of go on a social media blackout. And I kind of said, because a few of my family members were getting messaged, and I was kind of like, I'll take the heat, but my family didn't really sign up to be as public as me. So I did go kind of under and people were saying I was banned. I saw that you tweeted that I was like banned by Twitter, which I could see why people would think that because given the current climate, a lot of voices like ours are being censored, but um, it wasn't the case. You had, you had to basically deactivate your Twitter account because these people were posting your address or trying to get your address, trying to get other people to threaten you. And again, we saw the same thing 
about a week or two ago with the 16-year-old Trump supporter. Remember, we yeah. put out the footage of him uh, basically disagreeing with this stupid mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter supporter who thought that Donald Trump's wife was an illegal immigrant, basically completely like owned him in a debate. Um, that guy got some attention on you know, YouTube, on Twitter. They posted a picture of him at his workplace. They actively tried to encourage other BLM people to go out and harass this 16-year-old black kid simply because he supports Donald Trump. So again, the point I make over and over again, you know, leftists are the most intolerant people in politics. And again, while, you know, while they claim to celebrate and advance the LGBT community, it seems to me that they save their most vicious attacks for members of the LGBT community who yeah. dare to disagree with them. So why do you Basically, think, yeah, go ahead. Basically what it is, is, you know, Black Lives Matter, unless it's a black person who disagrees with you, because I saw a bunch of tweets um, from them towards that kid that you guys had on your channel. Um, and they were saying they were going to kill him, beat him up, find his workplace, find his house. It was crazy. And um, I saw like evidence on the Twitter that was doxing me and others that people were actually like talking about going to people's homes. That's kind of the main reason why I went under. Um, and then the LGBT thing, of course, like SJWs claim to care about trans lives, trans voices, talk about how we're always silenced, but they care when trans people are parroting their agenda. They don't care when trans people have their own opinions, which may, which may differ from theirs. No, exactly. I mean, look, look at what happened with Caitlyn Jenner. You know, when she yeah. first came out last year, she was celebrated as a goddess by the left. Yeah. They were like, bow down to the goddess. How dare you even criticize Absolutely. or critique her lifestyle? Then she came out, you know, a few months okay. later, or six months later, as quite a vehement conservative. She attacked Hillary Clinton on her own show. And then suddenly she wasn't so well liked by the left, correct? Isn't that, isn't that funny how, like, the new thing in 2016 is coming out as a conservative or coming out as not being progressive when it used to be, like, coming out as trans or coming out as gay? I just think it's funny. Um, I've had so many people message me saying that they are either LGBT or just anyone and they are so uncomfortable to share their political views or their social views because they'll lose their job. And I don't really blame them. You know, like there's a small number of us that are actually willing to be on the internet and be super open and use our names and show our faces because it actually is kind of risky. No, it is. I mean, and it's the same with Brexit here in the United Kingdom and especially London. I mean, I went to a, like a Brexit drinks party a couple of weeks ago and everyone there said, I'm afraid to tell anyone that I voted for Brexit because I might get fired, because I might get socially ostracized. And again, why is that? Why can't conservatives be comfortable in their political views? Well, it's because leftists are intolerant and they will gang up in groups to publicly shame people, to get them fired. And again, in some cases with the more violent extremist elements of Black Lives Matter, actually threaten to go out and target people, harass them violently in their own homes. So again, it underscores yeah. the fact that the left is completely intolerant. Absolutely. And I think like one of the main criticisms I got of my video from BLM was that, of course, that I was racist, that I was speaking against black people. I think it's interesting that there's this conflation of black people and Black Lives Matter, when in reality, there's a lot of people of all races within, within the movement. Of course, there's a lot of black people. But it like, I was looking at the news story of all those protesters that were arrested who were blocking traffic. I think it was on like I-49 or something. Forgive me if that number is wrong, but, um, and they were all white that were arrested. So that tells you possibly two things, right? It tells you that, first of all, criticizing Black Lives Matter is not inherently criticizing black people because it's full of white people in the movement as well. And then it also kind of shows that the police right now are scared to arrest black people. Um, if all the protesters that were arrested, literally every single one, I think there was like 25 or 30, were white. No, that's the point. Black Lives Matter is an ideology. It's not a race. Yeah. That's like saying if you criticize feminism, then you hate women. Feminism is not a gender. Okay, you've got the Washington Times reporting today. Black Vanderbilt pro professor says Black Lives Matter movement is pure Marxism. Okay, this is a black female professor criticizing Black Lives Matter. Is she racist? You have the black Harvard economist who did this study, which found that there was no racial bias in officer-involved shootings. And in fact, if you look at Houston, 
he found that black people were 20% less likely to get shot by cops compared to white people. Again, black Harvard economist. Is he racist for coming out with a study that counters the Black Lives Matter narrative? Again, BLM yeah. is not a race, it's an ideology. Ideologies yeah. are not immune from criticism, and calling somebody a racist isn't an argument. It's not a rebuttal. Now, I wanted to ask you here, we've got about five minutes left. There's also this YouTuber, I believe, who attacked you in a video called Onision. <laughs> and basically, this is a guy who makes videos claiming that feminism is about gender equality because that's what the dictionary definition says. When, of course, we know that modern feminism is actually this, you know, leftist supremacist hate movement that has nothing whatsoever to do with equality. But he has got a pretty substantial YouTube audience, which mainly consists of 15 year old girls. In fact, he had a poll on his Twitter in which he asked yeah. how old his audience was. And most of them were, you know, 14 to 17 year, years old. But again, that's quite yeah. a sizable mob. Uh, he did a video attacking you. And again, your, your accounts got flooded with harassment. Is that correct? Yeah, but you know, I'm never one to be like, oh, people are harassing me. It's not really that. Um, first of all, the hate mob was 13 year olds. So I was, I was not really affected. Um, <laughs> but I think that's all. You, <laughs> that's all you really need to know about them is that they're all, you know, little kids. Um, his video was it attacking me? Not necessarily. I made a response video to him first. He made a, an original video talking about feminism, which was just the stupidest thing on the planet. And so I made a video rebutting that one. He made another video two days ago in which he was, um, he didn't respond to a single one of my points about feminism. He just responded to like the jokes that I made, which was stupid. Um, so it, it kind of did just add on that like the same day that Black Lives Matter was descending upon me, all of these 13 year olds of Manision were too. But Again, I wasn't really even thinking about the Onision fans. It was more um, the Black Lives Matter people who were actually, you know, potentially those a threat. Are the, those are the most camp. extreme, exactly. But again, it's a peaceful group while they're, you know, shooting at officers' houses and dropping concrete blocks on their head. They're completely yeah. peaceful. Sally Cohn told me, CNN told me. Now, I wanted to switch gears. We've got a few minutes left, but um, transgender bathrooms, you know, we had the big, massive, months long debate about the North Carolina bathroom bill. Um, mm -hmm. Given that transgender people make up about 0.3% of the population, uh, and I, I don't really know your take on this, but they make up such a small minority of the population. Why is there such a huge debate over this? Why is it even an issue? Why do you think the left is pushing this? Well, what you're seeing is the politicization of transgenderism, which is so interesting to me. And it's actually one of the main reasons why I started my channel, because I saw what was once in my mind just a medical diagnosis suddenly turned into a social justice cause and into you know this political game and um as far as the bathrooms go part of me wishes we could just go back to the days where people didn't know what in the world being trans was cuz trans people have been you know using the restrooms for as long as they've been around um i think that both sides were kind of dumb on that issue i think that on one side there was definitely some rape hysteria coming from the super far right. And on the left on the left hand side, there was basically like really weird pushes for like gender neutral bathrooms, which most trans people don't even want. Most trans people just identify as one or the other. They don't identify as genderless and something in between. So to me it was just a big, a big cluster F of things that I didn't even have too strong of an opinion on either way. So again it's it's the left kind of appropriating the narrative from transgender mm -hmm. people and then again using them to go after people who they disagree with politically. The point I made was that if somebody wants to identify as a woman, then make the effort to identify as a woman. I mean, you could go in a, a, a woman's bathroom at any point, nobody would bat an eyelid. I think the problem lies with the people who just, you know, wishy-washy identify as different people from one day to the next. Yeah. And that's that's when it becomes a problem, right? Yeah, and I think that's the difference between what I call the Tumblrites, the trans trenders, and like actual trans people who have had a medical diagnosis and are doing the best with their situation. And the truth is, like you said, if you do make an effort, you should be fine. But it's the people who, like you said, willy nilly want to go back and forth or say that they're a third gender or whatever. Those people actually 
they're co-opting what trans is and they're actually making it harder for actual trans people. But again, we're such a small percentage of the population. I've never been one to expect some huge dramatic social change to accommodate such a small group, you know? Exactly. Now we're coming up against the break. So in the final minute, Blair, just tell people how they can find your YouTube videos, your Twitter account, etc. Okay, so first of all, my YouTube, which please subscribe, it's youtube.com slash Blair White X, and it's an E at the end of Blair. Uh, my Twitter is twitter.com slash MS Blair White, again with an E on Blair. And then other than that, you can just Google me and have fun. <laughs> Okay, and I'll, I'll put this interview up on my YouTube channel so people will be able to see it and share it tomorrow. Blair White, thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Okay, there goes Blair White again. Black Lives Matter is a peaceful group. They don't attack cops. They don't dox people. They don't threaten to reveal their addresses. They don't drop concrete blocks on cops' heads. They don't shoot into cops' home. They don't, you know, put out death threats on Twitter on a minute-by-minute minute basis. They're completely peaceful. Anyone that says otherwise is a racist. CNN told me. Sally Cohn told me. We'll be back with the final segment of the Alex Jones Show Live. Stay tuned. Breaking news at Infowars.com. Final segment of the Alex Jones Show. I mentioned this before the break. Washington Times reports Black Vanderbilt professor says Black Lives Matter movement is, quote, pure Marxism. Again, a black professor criticizing the Black Lives Matter movement. I guess she's racist. This is at the College Fix. Black Harvard economist finds no racial bias in officer-involved shootings. The youngest black professor ever to receive tenure at Harvard, and recipient of an economics pr prize for most promising American economists under the age of 40, has just upended the conventional wisdom on police shootings. There is no racial bias when officers fire on suspects, according to a new study by Professor Roland Fryer. Black suspects are actually less likely to be shot than other suspects. What do you think about that, Mark Lamont Hill? Facts don't care about your feelings. Calling somebody a racist isn't an argument. What are you going to do? Call this black Harvard professor a racist for finding these results in his study? Again, this is from the article. In 10 situations, officers in Houston were about 20% less likely to shoot a suspect if the suspect was black. Says the study conducted by a black Harvard economist. He must be a racist. Now, there's still no justice for the people in Idaho. This is out of World Net Daily. Mom of Idaho rape victim were being treated as criminals. This is more than a month after her five-year-old daughter was allegedly raped by a child refugee from Iraq. Lanley Shelley of Twin Falls, Idaho, says her little girl is still traumatized by the incident while local authorities have denied her access to basic documents such as the 911 transcripts, police and medical reports. So you remember the video a few weeks ago, we had the local residents in front of the town council absolutely furious that they were getting no answers on this. And now the victims are being stopped from getting answers, from getting transcripts in the effort to get justice. There's something absolutely rotten going on in the town of Twin Falls, Idaho. So we're going to continue to keep on top of that story. Business Insider reports the government may have broken the law with the EU referendum. The government failed to follow its own rules in the way it ran the Brexit referendum, according to a leading constitutional expert who said he agrees with a prominent Eurosceptic lawyer who raised the same point in the House of Commons. Basically, what's going on is they're trying to argue that because the government fear-mongering on Brexit wasn't successful and that ma the majority of people voted for leave, that that means the referendum should be run again. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. And this is coming out of the same, this is the same argument from people who say that I had an argument with someone on Facebook today who said, you're anti-democratic for refusing to support a second referendum. Okay, so this is somebody who wants to ignore, annul, and cancel the democratic will of the British people in the biggest turnout for a vote on anything for decades. They want to annul that. They want to cancel that. They want to have as many referendums as is necessary until they get the result they want. And yet they have the temerity, they have the nerve to call me anti-democratic. This is how these people operate. Now we've got The Sun reporting 
Psychiatrists reveal alarming rise in number of patients seeking help for Brexit and anxiety. Concerned psychiatrists there, they have been deluged with patients seeking help for Brexit and anxiety since the vote to ditch the EU. So all the little safe space triggly puffs are just melting down and crying because they lost the vote. Again, they're out on the streets trying to annul the democratic will of the British people in the name of love, when in fact they're authoritarian, they're anti-democratic, everything about them should be rejected. And yes, we are going to Brexit. You lost, deal with it, get over it. That's going to wrap it up for the Alex Jones Show. Alex will be back 11 to 2 tomorrow. InfoWars Nightly News coming up tonight. Breaking news at InfoWars.com.